We're going to get started in the next minute. If you can quiet down a little bit, make sure that your phones are on silent or off. Though we would recommend you can tweet. You should tweet about everything that's happening in here. So keep them on, but just silent. Okay, we are good. Buenas tardes. El Consejo Municipal siempre luchará para mantener a nuestras familias inmigrantes unidas. Hoy el Comité de Inmigración del Consejo Municipal hablará sobre la importancia de la co coordinación entre agencias de la ciudad para servir a nuestras familias, nuestras familias inmigrantes, de mejorar sus vidas. Específicamente exploraremos cómo la ciudad ayuda a los padres inmigrantes con niños menores de 5 años. Hablaremos de los servicios disponibles para la salud maternal y infantil, infantil y de los programas de pre-kinder, uh, pre-K, universal pre-K, ofrecidos por la ciudad. El comité, el comité explorará cuáles los son los obstáculos comunes para familias inmigrantes que buscan est estos servicios de la ciudad y, y considerará co recomendaciones para mejorar el sistema y vamos a escuchar de padres, vamos a escuchar de organizaciones y también las agencias ahora. Gracias a todos por estar aquí con nosotros. And again, my name is Carlos Benchaca and I'm the chair of the Immigration Committee here at the New York City Council. I want to thank our council committee, and uh, we have from Queens, uh, Council Member Holden, and I will be announcing them as they come in. Roughly two-thirds of New York City residents are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Stop and think about that for a second. Two-thirds of all New Yorkers, all New Yorkers, not just in Brooklyn, not just in my district, all New Yorkers. Today, we are focused on our littlest New Yorkers. And we know that children growing up in immigrant families often bear the burden of this lack of resources, this lack of access to resources, and the disparities in this access to health and early education are just two examples that can and do have lasting impacts. The early years, ages zero to five, are critical for later life outcomes in any child's development. In fact, the research has shown that Disparities in vocabulary begin to appear at 18 months, 18 months old, and grow exponentially. So that by three years old, children of college-educated parents or caregivers have two to three times the vocabulary of those parents who have not completed high school. And that there is 90 to 100% chance of developmental delays when children experience six to seven risk factors, such as abuse, neglect, exposure, exposure to mental health issues, including domestic violence and substance abuse, divorce or separation of parents and caregivers, detention or deportation of a parent or caregiver. With having seven to eight adverse childhood experiences, children have a three to one odds of contracting adult onset heart disease. Additionally, the Migration Policy Institute found that children of undocumented immigrants had lower preschool enrollment, experienced high rates of linguistic isolation and limited English proficiency, higher rates of poverty than their peers, and reduced socioeconomic progress overall. These negative outcomes were found to have lasting impacts throughout life, affecting individuals, affecting individuals' future socioeconomic status and well-being in adulthood. That is why today the Immigration Committee is holding an oversight hearing on existing citywide resources for immigrant parents of children ages zero to five. The committee will explore how programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, the Newborn Home Visiting Program, the Early Intervention Program, and outreach and education efforts like the Safe Sleep and Breastfeeding Information campaigns serve immigrant and mixed status families. We will also be looking at universal pre-K and 3K programs. Specifically, the committee will explore how these programs are serving immigrants, uh, immigrant and mixed status families. Specifically, the committee will explore whether 
These initiatives and services and outreach are conducted in a linguistically and culturally appropriate manner. And whether services are available in neighborhoods with high immigrant populations. The committee will also explore how the deep fear in our com in immigrant communities has impacted families' desire to seek out supportive city services. Immigrants are more fearful than ever and are sending and they're fearful of sending their children to school, seeking out city services for themselves or their families, and even seeking assistance from police and the court system. As a result, it is imperative that city agencies be acutely aware of the needs of immigrant families and tailor their services accordingly. Further, we hope that this is at the start, we are at the start of many conversations about the emotional well-being of our immigrant and mixed status families. The persistent uncertainty of federal immigration policy, which changes abruptly, sometimes overnight, places significant and extensive emotional stress on our immigrant families. This is especially true for children, and studies show that uncertainty about the fate of their parents leaves children living in stress and fear for extended periods of time. This is called toxic stress, and it can have a significant and endless negative consequence on a child's learning and development. So the city must recognize the negative impacts that persistent fear and stress have on children's well-being and be and begin thinking of ways to counter these negative impacts. Mental health cannot be an afterthought. We must support children and families in a comprehensive, holistic manner. Today, the council and the administration will consider ways to better support immigrant parents. This is a conversation that the Committee on Immigration began with city agencies and community members when in the fall of 2016, we held a hearing on interagency coordination of services for immigrant families. This is also why the council passed a law that requires Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, to convene an interagency task force to discuss how the city can coordinate their services and better address the immigrant needs, the immigrant needs that our New Yorkers are facing, issues like the ones that we are gonna to explore today. Today is also a reaffirmation of the city's commitment to ensure that we support parents with young children in a meaningful way one that we can measure, and the one that we can keep accountable. With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's hearing, and I would like to remind you that we want you to fill out a witness slip, uh, which you can find at the door if you haven't done that. If you haven't done that, please do that. Uh, this is going to help us put the panels together. To provide context for the hearing and the testimony, uh, we will first hear from a couple of impacted parents, followed by the administration who will give their testimony, we'll ask them questions, and then we'll open up the floor to all of you in our neighborhoods, in our organizations, and other parents that might want to speak as well. And I think we have our first panel set. I will call your name, and if you can come to the desk over here by the mics. Uh, our first parent is Camille Mackler. And uh, uh, Tammy Lynn will be represented uh, by Ms. Ling Yi Neller, uh, who will read out loud her testimony, and she could not be here today. There were parents that we invited today that could not show up for multiple reasons, including childcare. And so to them, we think about them in this moment, and we will be following up with them to make sure that we get their testimony. And I'm really happy and, and proud that you're here today to start us off. And uh, if we can start first uh, with Ms. Camille Mackler. Thank you, uh, Chairman Menchaca, and thank you for this opportunity and, and Council Member Holden. Um, I have appeared in front of you too many times to count, um, and this is the first time I've been here in my personal capacity, but this is something that is very important to me. I wanted to speak a little of the challenges I've had in obtaining special services for my daughter who is being raised bilingual in the city. Um, my daughter is currently enrolled in a school in your district at K280 in a UPK program. She speaks English primarily, but I speak to her only in French, and that is her second language at home. The delays that I have experienced mean that my daughter will have taken almost the entire UPK year to get the services that she needs to be able to succeed in school. We requested our first, and I go into this in more detail in my written testimony, but we requested an evaluation on November 2nd. To this date, I have yet to meet with a district to determine what additional evaluations may be necessary 
or what services she may be qualified to receive. Um, and during that time, her difficulties in learning have only grown, um, and she has only fallen further and further behind her own peers. The delays are because of two factors. Um, the first one is challenges in getting accommodation because she is a bilingual child. And the second one are a burdensome, opaque, and slow bureaucracy. The evaluation site that is contracted by the DOE to provide the evaluation services did not provide an interpreter, refused to conduct the evaluations without an interpreter, and told me that by law I had to provide the interpreter. Um, something which, despite my years of, of experience advocating to this administration, I was I did not challenge, um, stupidly in, <laughs> in, in hindsight. Um, two evaluations out of the four that she's received so far had to be rescheduled um, because of that. I have no idea how they would have handled this if I had not spoken English. Because they had no French speakers on staff, they made no provision to have French speakers on staff, they only speak English and, French, and Spanish in the evaluation site, and they never made any attempt to help um, address the language issues. The other issue is that every step that was taken, every, everything that happened, happened because I called multiple times, I emailed, I made myself known to them. Anyone who's ever worked with me in this room knows that I don't let go. <laughs> when I start working on something, you can only imagine when my child is the one who's at stake. In one instance, I had to remind them that there was a 60-day deadline by which they had to complete the evaluations, at which point they scheduled two more evaluations. Um, and then I had to remind them of the deadline again before they would send me a copy of the evaluation and for, forward them onto the district. Ultimately, I was able to tap into a lot more resources. I live in Windsor Terrace, which is right next to Park Slope, which we all know is the mecca of parenting for Brooklyn, if not New York City. I have access to listservs through my professional networks. I have access to advocates on these issues. Um, I have health insurance, so I have a pediatrician in private practice who also worked through this with me, and through that, I was able to connect to other advocates who gave me information of how to challenge a district, who gave me information on how to hire a lawyer, because commonly, parents have to hire attorneys to compel the district to provide the services that they need. Um, I was able to be connected to a private evaluator, and we have the means to pay the thousands of dollars we are now going to be paying to have her privately evaluated. Um, I now know that when I do finally have my meeting with a district, which is currently scheduled for next week, I will have to push for more evaluations. Um, and what is worse is that I have learned that none of this is uncommon. Now, my daughter does not have a learning disability, nor is she on the autism spectrum. She, her, her needs are more around speech and occupational therapy and processing issues. While they are impeding her learning, these are not the most serious needs that I know many parents face in this city. I can't imagine what it would feel like to have a child going through those issues and not have the resources and the knowledge that I have access to. I, my daughter has been accepted to a dual language program in Brooklyn next year. She'll be going to a French-English dual language program if she can enter general education, which I still don't know. But it is my wish for her to be able to learn to read, write, and speak in her native, two of her native languages. So I am pushing for her to be able to have a general education um, with the proper support, and I, I know that I'm going to have to fight for that. At the end of the day, I would never pretend to know the challenges that immigrant communities face in New York City. Although I have been advocating for them for 15 years, I speak, read, write in English. I am a lawyer who graduated from an American law school. I have, because of me and my husband's um, professional occupations, we have access to private health insurance and to an income that allows us to provide these private services. But if I, with all of my experience advocating to city agencies, have had this much trouble, I can't imagine what it must be like for parents of an immigrant family. I have spent 15 years working for immigrants in this city, and I know that one of the biggest reasons they come here is to provide better opportunities for their children, and it is breaking my heart to see how difficult that is and how much work we still have to do. But I wanna end first by thanking the city, city council and the administration for UPK, because without access to a trained educator, we would have never known my daughter had these issues, faced these issues, until much on, until much later when it could possibly have had even a greater impact and been harder to resolve. And I especially want to end by giving a shout out to Miss Tony and Miss Mary in classroom 276 at K280 for all the support and the, and the patience that they have shown us and their partnership in all this process. Thank you, Miss Mackler, and thank you for your testimony today. That helps us uh, kind of set the tone and the set of questions that I think we're going to want to explore. Uh, we've been joined by Brooklyn's uh, council member, Matthew Jean, uh, and also Brooklyn's uh, uh, very own Kalman Yeager. 
council member uh, right next to me in Borough Park. And we also have a third parent that made it up, uh, Mr. Sasar Suniga. If you can join uh, the panel, we have your, if you're in here, yep, you can just join the panel to third. And uh, and also uh, Ms. Ms. Ling uh, Yi Neller is also representing uh, Ms. Tammy Lin, if you can read her testimony. And I will also say that uh, uh, Ms. Ling uh, Yi Neller is uh, on my team and on my staff and organizes uh, through my office participatory budgeting, working with parents um, from all, all over the district, but specifically uh, and liaison on to our Chinese families in Sunset Park. Thank you for being here today. And uh, if, you can, if you can go and read the testimony. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, I'm. <coughs> I have worked uh, today. I'm here um, at my private capacity, uh, representing a parent who is not able to be here due mm, due to her inability to take time off from work. As immigrant parents, the first thing is they struggle to pay rent to keep to keep the family housed and uh, uh, and fed. Um, Ms. Tammy Ling was among one of the was among the parents that had a meeting with council member back early March when they brought the issue of um, early childhood care and uh, UPK overcrowding um, of UPK in Sunset Park to um, council member Carlos Minchaka, and uh, um, this is her original this is her statement that I'm going to read now. Hello, my name is Tammy Lin. Um, I have a four-year-old son who was diagnosed with uh, uh, speech um, speech development uh, issues back when he was two years old, and we were very lucky. Uh, when we applied for IEP program, we got approved right away, and uh, a teacher visits us um, every week um, to to help my son getting uh, getting his language needs, and then I work with the teacher to learn the programming and then how to work with my son to improve his uh, language development, and the result has been phenomenal. My, ch my son still needs to be in uh, special education, but he's improving a lot because of the IEP program. But I know, but around me, I know many people who are not so lucky. Um, Due to the school, due to the overcrowding, due to the lack of bilingual uh, teachers for the IEP program, um, many of my friends whose children have uh, language developmental I delays, uh, they are put into waiting program. They're put into waiting for many months before they can get a teacher. Um, two of my friends are still waiting after ten months waiting, uh, and. Uh, uh, children have children are the IEP program is for children between the age of zero to three. Uh, when you put children into a one or two year waiting, uh, they will just you are missing the golden opportunity for children to get early childhood intervention. And a lot of children born in immigrant household, especially low income immigrant household, they are prone to develop. Um, to they're prone to have language development delays uh, because of the complex. Uh, environment they're in, they are exposed to multilingual environment, and their parents, because they're low income, the parents also lack the education um, education level or the language skills to help the children bridge the gap of the environment. Therefore, those children are left behind, and then when they, um, and then I, it's essential that they get bilingual IEP teachers to help them because the parents are involved. The parents need to learn from the teachers to um, help the children get on board. Uh, but from the p a lot of friends that I know, because they cannot get IEP, they, mm, because there's a lack of bilingual teachers, so they either uh, wait for months without getting their children on board on time, or they have to or they have to pick an English-speaking teacher, but then that totally defeats the IEP, the purpose of IEP program, which is to have the parents and teacher involved in it, to design an individualized program to help the children. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we are uh, we are lucky, uh, but I I personally know over a dozen um, a dozen par such families. Uh, who have applied for IEP but are still waiting for their bilingual children after many months in Sansa Park. Um, and, uh, um, and then this is very crucial. This is so crucial. 
it's uh, the children are missing out this golden opportunity to have the correction before they enter uh, before they enter school because IEP it's home the teachers come to your house between the age of zero to three after three years old they go to special school um, and uh, uh, when they miss out on that uh, it's they are basically they are losing before they even start school they are losing in uh, at the beginning line um, and uh, and in my community there are a lot of people there's a uh, there are a lot of children who are called satellite babies, uh, immigrant children, immigrant parents who cannot afford childcare. They send their uh, they send their children back home to the home country to be taken care of by grandparents, and then sent back to um, to America to attend school when they reach school age, usually is four to five years old. And uh, when those uh, and a lot of those children, when they suddenly come back to uh, a brand new environment, they have um, some, a lot of them experience psychological problem, developmental problem, and the language barrier, language development problem. And they need, they also need bilingual teachers who can help them guide through that phase. And then w everywhere I look around in my community, there's a huge lack of bilingual Chinese teachers. Um, I am, um, in my one in one of my friend's schools, um, there is only one bilingual Chinese teacher that is shared by kindergarten, uh, by pre-K, kindergarten, and um, and elementary school, uh, and uh, uh, all of this is placing a huge burden on on the parents and then making uh, and a huge burden on the children who are not who are not getting the help they need at a, at an age when they can be helped. Thank you so much uh, for for the testimony and your own uh, kind of review of experiences with our parents in Sunset Park. And then our final, uh, Cesar Zuniga from Sunset Park as well. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for, for having this uh, really important hearing. Um, I think uh, the first thing that I want to say is that you know, children develop in context, right? And children develop within families and they develop within communities. So I so appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. And um, I also want to thank the administration and the council for, you know, the, the support. Uh, our first speaker talked about UPK. There's uh, fir City's First Readers. Uh, these are all extremely important initiatives. Um, but I will say that we have a long way to go and we need to keep our foot on the accelerator, uh, particularly in this context when we're talking about immigrant uh, families. Um, as the son of, Im of, of an immigrant family, I, I know firsthand um, that the, the risk factors and the challenges are high. And, um, uh, and I also know that notwithstanding some of those risk factors, um, immigrant parents have a lot of strengths and they have a lot of resources. And if we are able to capitalize on those resources and really bring programming to families uh, that capitalize on these resources, I think uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna see a lot better integration of our immigrants. We're gonna see a lot more participation. Um, and on that note, on on the participation note, um, well, le let me take a step back. So I, I wear two hats today. Uh, I'm the research and evaluation director for the uh, Parent Child Home Program which is an internationally implemented program that serves two and three year old kids. Uh, we have sites all across the five boroughs and in 14 states. Um, and w one of the, th uh, the sort of the two or three outcomes that we're really focused on um, are the integration of the families into the context. Um, and we do that because we're an intensive home visiting program that spends a lot of time in homes. We spend two, uh, two days a week over two years um, and that really gives us the opportunity to create good relationships with the families. Um, and typically, uh, these families are, um, especially now, I mean, I think the, the last five to 10 years have see, has seen a real shift in the demographics of our, of our population within PCHP that reflects the, the shift in the population across the city and across the country. So as of uh, last year, we, we are, uh, 
predominantly immigrant serving program. 70% of our families <coughs> come from a different country. 68% don't speak English as their first language. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing that not just in early childhood programs like ours, but across a whole bunch of different contexts. Um, so the outcomes are really to uh, empower the parents, provide them tools and resources through literacy and play to, uh, to allow them to help their children become ready for school. Now in that process, what we also achieve is the engagement of the parents. Um, and one of the things that we have found is that in, in contexts where we have predominantly immigrant families, we have the highest retention rates. And we started to look into this more uh, scientifically, and we indeed found that um, immigrant parents are a little harder to engage initially, but once you engage them and once you demonstrate that this program is gonna, is gonna affect your life in a positive way, they stick around. So one of the take homes for us is that if we build programming that is sensitive, culturally appropriate to the families, they're gonna utilize the services. So just to give you an example, in Queens, we have a site that where we have 94% retention rate. Now, th these are folks who in the literature appear to be very transient and non-committal and, and, and have all these risk factors that prevent them from participating. Um, that's not what we find in our data. And so again, uh, you know, we're, we're constantly um, advocating across a whole bunch of different uh, state capitals and even at the federal government that um, when you build programming that's responsive, parents will utilize it. Um, and you know, as long as, as long as we, again, keep in mind the, the need, I mean, the, the needs that are way beyond um, what some of us here can ever comprehend. And I, and I wanna just echo the, the, the comments from, from our first speaker. I have a child who also has special needs and the amount of resources, the amount of, of time, and when I talk about resources, I mean in terms of our sort of human resources and the money that we had to spend to get the services that my kid was in, uh, rightly entitled to is beyond the pale. And we had a conversation, a very similar conversation around the fact that if we have to go through that, and we have, I, I have a PhD in early childhood education, my partner has a degree in, in early childhood education, and, and if we had to uh, sort of climb such a big hill to get the services that my kid needed, um, we can't even begin to imagine what, um, what some of these uh, folks who don't have resources, who don't have uh, the time and the money uh, to, to advocate for their children. So um, that, that's from a personal perspective. I'm also the, the chair of the community board in Sunset Park. And in that work, um, unfortunately, I have become painfully aware of, of how, um, what a disconnect there is between families and what, what they're entitled to in terms of services for their children. Um, there are countless cases in our community of families who, who have absolutely no idea where to begin the process. Uh, we have countless families who have begun the process but are not being treated well. They're not being uh, attended to in the right way. Uh, they're not being consulted uh, like you would see in other communities. And um, one of the things that I wanna do, and, and I hope the, you, know, uh, you guys will, will join in the effort, is to, is to really begin to have a conversation in, in these communities, an accessible conversation about what services exist and how to maneuver the process. At the same time, we should also start a conversation around how do, we, um, how do we change up some of these processes, right? Because I think part of what, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, the bureaucracies are set up in a way that aren't really receptive, not just to the general population, but especially to folks who don't have uh, resources such as immigrants. Um, the final thing that I wanna, I wanna just leave you with, um, the earlier, so this is from, from the literature on just early childhood education generally. I think it's very clear that the earlier that we intervene in children's lives, 
uh, the, the more outcomes, the more positive outcomes we're gonna have over time. The return on investment is, is significant. For every dollar that we spend in early childhood, we get $7 back. Um, and I think the, the most important and the most relevant thing for today is that the earlier we start intervening with children, the more engaged parents become, not just in the lives of their children, but in all of the support systems and institutions that are in the context where their children are developing. Uh, thank you, not just from the position of a parent, but as an, a highly educated New Yorker, uh, and a kind of civics, civicsly minded, both of you have kind of really presented the hurdles, even for for parents who have many, many resources at their hand. So thank you so much for this panel. Uh, we're going to move over to the administration, uh, where we will hear from the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. Uh, they have brought several other um, uh, members of different agencies. Uh, so whomever w is going to be uh, kind of conducting the Q and A, et cetera, if we can make if you can make your way to to the dais. This is great. Um, I am, I'm uh, really happy that the agencies are here uh, testifying and kind of speaking on all the different issues that we're talking about. Uh, we have Ms. Abigail Villico from DOHMH. We have Maite Junko, from the Senior Advisor to the Chancellor of the Department of Education. And then we also have John Tritt uh, from the Department of Education as well, and the Director of Outreach. We have uh, Rolel, Lo, Lorelai Vargas, the Deputy Commissioner for ACS as well. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, you can choose who goes first uh, in this work uh, or in, in this conversation on this committee, but whoever wants to go first, go ahead and testify. And we also know that the, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is, is, is in the house as well. Um, and if they, we need an, any, any Q&A from them, they, they'll, they'll come up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Manchaka and members of the committee. I am uh, Dr. Abigail Velikoff, Senior Director of the Early Childhood Health and Development Unit of the Division of Family and Child Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett and Deputy Commissioner George Askew, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the many ways the department supports expectant parents and families with children from, bir from birth to five years old. Before I talk about the department's programming, it is important to note that the department serves all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration or documentation status. We do not request any information concerning immigration status as a condition for participating in our programming, and our services are offered to families who meet the income and service eligibility requirements without any consideration of immigration status. The department aims to protect and promote the health of all New Yorkers, regardless of origin, education, and primary language. Therefore, in a city where 40% of our population is foreign born and 24% have limited English proficiency, providing language services representing the diversity of New Yorkers is vital to the agency's mission and goals. Our comprehensive language access policy mandates that emergency communications, legal notices, and health bulletins are translated into any languages spoken by at least 1% of the New York City LEP population. All other communications are translated into any languages spoken by at least 5% of the eligible population as determined by program or census data and may be translated into additional languages if necessary. We also offer professional interpretation, including telephonic interpretation, in-person interpretation, and American Sign Language interpretation. This policy ensures wide access to information and allows DOHMH to eliminate language barriers to its services. The first five years of life are foundational for assuring lifelong physical, cognitive, economic, and social-emotional health and development. 
the impact of both the physical environment, home, early care and education settings and neighborhoods, and socio-emotional socio environments, relationships that young children share with their primary caregivers and other adults in their lives are critical to future health and well-being. In a city of numerous health and development disparities, our best hope of achieving overall health and development equity rests in early investments and supports before a woman even begins to consider becoming pregnant. One of the cornerstones of a truly comprehensive public health department is the robust support and promotion of the health and development of young children. We know that investments made in the early, earliest years of life reap benefits beyond early health and development to life success and fiscal savings for all. The department is committed to pr the promotion of the health and development of our littlest New Yorkers. This commitment is evident, for, evident in, for example, in the Division of Family and Child Health, whose vision is that every child, woman, and family in New York City recognizes their power and is given the opportunity to reach their full health and development potential. The majority of programming for families of our littlest New Yorkers is offered through this division and other divisions with relevant programming, including the Division of Mental Hygiene, Division of Environmental Health, and the Center for Health Equity, work closely with this division to coordinate service delivery across the department. The department offers a number of resources and avenues of support for families and parents, expectant parents, and those who may become parents. The Here For You campaign launched in 2017 on social media, television, subways, and buses encouraged parents and caregivers to call 311 or visit the department's website to learn about the range of available city resources and services. Calls to 311 are routed to the Early Childhood Health and Development Unit who provides information and support specific to parents and caregivers' needs. This campaign also promoted the department's programs for families with young children, including neighborhood-based parent groups, home visiting programs, and the early intervention program. Our neighborhood-based parent groups, called Parents Connect, were launched in 2017 in response to parent focus groups that indicated a desire for parents and caregivers to connect with one another and learn about early childhood health and development, including department resources. The Nurse Family Partnership Program provides evidence-based support for first-time mothers through voluntary home visits by specially trained nurses to help improve pregnancy outcomes, child health and development, and to provide our littlest New Yorkers with the best possible start in life. NFP is available to first-time mothers who meet income requirements, regardless of age or immigration, immigration status, and services are provided to families throughout the five boroughs. NFP also works with mothers in the foster care system, homeless shelters, and those involved in juvenile justice and are either incarcerated or recently released from Rikers Island. The program serves over 2,500 unique clients annually. And thanks to funding from the City Council, we have been able to significantly expand NFP and increase capacity by over 30% <coughs> and reach additional families. The Newborn Home Visiting Program, another health department home visiting program, offers voluntary home visits to families in the South Bronx, East and Central Harlem, and North and Central Brooklyn with an infant birth to two months of age to facilitate the adjustment to parenthood, assure a safe living environment for families, provide maternal and infant health education on topics including child development and safe sleep, offer breastfeeding support, and identify health and social issues that require referral to community-based services. In 2015, the Newborn Home Visiting Program expanded its reach to provide visits to all families with an infant birth to two months of age who reside in a Department of Homeless Services shelter. This collaboration has enabled more comprehensive and coordinated education and support to meet the needs of family and shelter, and we have been able to reach over 1,500 families residing in shelters since then. The program recruits participants at hospitals and receives a daily client listing of eligible families from DHS to serve families residing in homeless shelters. The Early Intervention Program provides a broad array of services to children birth to three years old with or at risk of developmental delays or disabilities and insists and empowers families to meet their children's needs. 
infants or toddlers suspected of having a developmental delay or disability can be referred to the EI program by a wide range of individuals, including family members, doctors, social service workers, child care workers, and staff at community organizations. EI services are provided to families citywide, regardless of immigration status, and include speech therapy, special instruction, and physical and occupational therapy. The program serves over 30,000 New York City children each year. The Cribs for Kids program provides free cribs to families in need of a safe sleep space for their children. Outreach workers provide cribs to new parents in parts of the South Bronx, East and Central Harlem, and North and Central Brooklyn during home visits. Families in the Newborn Home Visiting Program and Nurse Family Partnership Program also receive cribs and safe sleep education. The Healthy Start Brooklyn Program out of the Center for Health Equities Brooklyn Health Action Center provides a variety of support programs for new parents who live in the neighborhoods of Brownsville, East New York, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Bedford and Bushwick, including childbirth and parenting education, fitness classes, and resources on breastfeeding, perinatal depression, developmental delays and stress relief, group prenatal care through centering pregnancy, the In the Circle Fathers Program, healthy families home visiting, and doula services. The department has several initiatives to encourage breastfeeding and address the racial and ethnic disparities in breastfeeding rates. We offer breastfeeding education and pumps to new mothers through our home visiting programs, develop and distribute educational materials and information to providers and consumers about breastfeeding, work with community-based organizations to build local capacities to support breastfeeding, and offer trainings to local healthcare providers, hospital staff, and field workers, including certified lactation counselor, train the trainer, and community breastfeeding educator courses. Last year, we also installed a lactation pod, a self-contained mobile unit that offers a comfortable and private space for breastfeeding or pumping in each borough, including public locations such as the Bronx Zoo, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, and the Staten Island Children's Museum. As part of Latch On NYC, we work with hospitals to support mothers who choose to breastfeed, reduce formula supplementation to healthy breastfed infants during the hospital stay, and discontinue distribution of promotional or free infant formula that can interfere with a mother's choice to breastfeed. The New York City Breastfeeding Hospital Collaborative works to increase the number of maternity facilities that achieve the World Health Organization and UNICEF baby friendly designation a special recogni recognition for hospitals and birthing centers that offer an optimal level of care for infants and feeding and mother-baby bonding. There are currently 16 baby-friendly designated maternity hospitals and birthing centers in New York City. The Brooklyn Breastfeeding Empowerment Zone is a place-based initiative in North and Central Brooklyn run by our Center for Health Equities Brooklyn Health Action Center. BFEZ trains and recognizes the power of community members to support breastfeeding parents and families, including male partners and family members, faith-based leaders, small businesses, and other community members to ensure that every mother and baby has the opportunity to experience the health benefits of breastfeeding. Additionally, we engage local groups, faith-based organizations, employers and employees to adopt practices that protect, promote, and support breastfeeding through our Breastfeeding Friendly Spaces Initiative and Know Your Rights workshops. The department works collaboratively with other city agencies, including the Department of Education and the Administration for Children's Services, to coordinate service delivery for families and children. For example, DOE sends information packets on NYC Well, the city's connection to free confidential crisis counseling, mental health and substance misuse support, information and referral, and avail available health resources home with students in an effort to reach more families. We also participate in cross-agency work groups, including the Children's Cabinet. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, <coughs> and we look forward to continuing to work with the Council to connect New York City families to the comprehensive range of department programming and services. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for that. Do we have copies, by the way, of that testimony? Yeah, we do, okay, thank you. Buenas tardes. 
Good afternoon, Chair Menchaca and members of the Committee on Immigration. I am Lorelai Atali Vargas, Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing for the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss ACS's programs and initiatives that serve immigrant parents of children ages zero to five years. The Administration for Children's Services protects and promotes the safety and well-being of New York City's children, young people, families, and communities by providing child welfare, juvenile justice, and early care and education services throughout the city. Along with our community partners, ACS provides support and neighborhood-based services to all of New York City's families, including immigrant parents, to help ensure children grow up in safe, permanent homes with strong families. Many of ACS's programs and services are offered without regard to immigration status, and printed materials for our programs and services are largely available in a variety of languages, including our parents' rights literature, which is available in 11 languages. ACS's Office of Immigration Services and Language Access closely monitors all program areas within ACS for compliance with language access mandates and trains the agency's foster care providers to identify and refer all non-citizen children in care for legal services in the interest of gaining special immigrant juvenile status or other forms of legal status when possible. In the past eight months, this office has certified over 180 U and T visas, some benefiting families with children ages zero to five. ACS is dedicated to promoting the well-being of all New York City's children and families. Over the past year, the agency has significantly enhanced our work in preventive services to provide supports for families before a need for intervention arises. In September 2017, ACS created the Division of Child and Family Well-Being, making ACS the first child welfare agency in the country to spearhead a new primary prevention approach, which seeks to reach families proactively with services, resources, and educational messages that can support healthy children, families, and communities. The Division of Child and Family Wellbeing, or CFWB, aims to engage families before they ever reach the child welfare system with resources and services to help them thrive. CFWB focuses on the factors that contribute to child, to contribute to family well-being, including health, education, employment, and culture, and uses place-based and population-based approaches to engage families and communities. CFWB's scope includes ACS's community partnership programs, family enrichment centers, the Safe Sleep Initiative, the Medication Safety Campaign, early care and education, and a new office of equity strategies that works to identify strategies to reduce inequities, implicit bias, and other factors that contribute to disparate outcomes for the families and communities we serve. One of the first major initiatives of the new division was the fall 2017 launch of ACS's medication safety campaign, an effort to help parents and caregivers ensure that medications and potentially dangerous household items are stored out of children's reach. In addition to this information campaign, we've begun to distribute lock boxes and bags to families engaged with ACS, and we will eventually share them across the city agencies, as well as with programs that provide in-home services. Lock boxes and bags are easy and effective ways to keep medication accessible to parents, but out of children's reach. We're bringing our awareness campaign across the city and literature will be available in multiple languages. ACS's Safe Sleep Initiative was launched in 2015 with the goal of diminishing the occurrence of sleep-related infant injury deaths. In 2016, ACS partnered with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to launch a public awareness campaign to educate parents and caregivers about the potentially fatal risks associated with unsafe sleep practices and our sustained efforts have yielded encouraging results. Since the launch of ACS's Safe Sleep Initiative, there has been a significant reduction in the number of sleep-related infant injury deaths reported to the statewide central register of child abuse and maltreatment, also families known to ACS. There was a 17% decrease 
in sleep-related infant deaths reported to the SCR from 2015 to 2016. In 2017, the ACS Safe Sleep Team trained over 10,000 child welfare and healthcare professionals and prenatal patients, fatherhood groups, community and faith-based organizations, expectant and parenting teens, formerly incarcerated mothers, public housing residents, and homeless families. This important work was conducted in communities with the highest rates of sleep-related infant deaths. We are now developing a safe sleep kit to pilot for dissemination to maternity patients at the city's 11 health and hospital facilities. As 15% of New York City's annual births occur at h, &H facilities, we anticipate reaching approximately 18,000 families. <clears throat> the foundation of the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing is early care and education. CFWB currently administers one of the largest publicly funded child care systems in the country with the capacity to serve almost 110,000 infants, toddlers, preschool, and school-aged children to age 13. ACS provides access to child care in two primary ways. We run a contracted system called Early Learn, which serves children between the ages of six weeks and five years, and includes both state-funded child care programs and federally funded Head Start programs. We also fund vouchers that parents may use to purchase care in a variety of settings for children between the ages of six weeks and 13 years. Further, ACS serves children with special needs through age 18 and up to age 19 if they are a full-time student in an educational or vocational activity. Our services enhance child development and assist eligible public assistance recipients, low-income working families, and families that are receiving child welfare services. While New York City residents may access a variety of services through ACS, regardless of their citizenship or immigration status, such information is required in order to access some child care services through ACS. Children and families that receive cash assistance must follow TANF eligibility rules, which require the parents to be a citizen. Families applying for non-mandated CCBG funded child care through vouchers and early learn, except Head Start programs, must certify that all children to receive child care are citizens, nationals, or persons with satisfactory immigration status, but are not required to note citizenship or immigration status of anyone else in the family. However, the application does require families to attest to understanding that information about the children noted in the application may be submitted to INS. Head Start programs do not require documentation of citizenship immigration status, and DOE-funded pre-K seats are exempt from the citizenship immigration status requirements. ACS works in earnest to make sure that families understand citizenship and immigration status requirements to access our child care programs. To help ensure cl clarity, CFWB works with all of our child care providers so that they can clearly discuss these requirements with families. And we also created signs that clearly articulate immigration status requirements, which are posted conspicuously in our resource areas where families apply for child care. I'm also excited to share that our child care application will officially be updated as of May 1st. We worked collaboratively with Moya to implement changes to our application to ensure that immigration information is collected only for the child in need of subsidized care, and that instructions were clear for parents and guardians. While New York City has gone to great lengths to ensure that child care services are accessible to all families in the city, we firmly believe that immigration status should not be a barrier to accessing quality child care and early education programs. We are proud that CFWB's Early Learn program has become a pillar for promoting healthy childhood development while also providing wraparound supports to families, a hallmark of Early Learn. As you know, ACS's Early Learn contracts will be transferred and integrated into the Department of Education's Division of Early Childhood Education in 2019 as part of Mayor de Blasio's commitment to early education. This integration will build on the important work done by Early Learn programs today, strengthening birth to five care 
and education in New York City and creating a more seamless experience for children and families into elementary school and beyond. The transfer of Early Learn will also support the Mayor's 3K for All initiative, which will ultimately offer free, high quality early education services to all three-year-olds in New York City. As Early, Learn and, as Early Learn transfers to the Department of Education, ACS will continue to administer the city's child care voucher system. We will continue our efforts to bolster the quality of care in this system, which serves close to 30,000 children under the age of five, in collaboration with the Human Resources Administration, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Department of Education. And we are committed to continued efforts to make childcare available to some of the most vulnerable families in New York City. As a city, we all share a responsibility for protecting children and supporting families. To help further this mission, ACS and the Department of Homeless Services executed a memorandum of understanding which enables ACS and DHS to share information between agencies about children and families in shelter system and also requires shelter providers to issue vital information to families such as information on availability of child care and safe sleep practices for infants. All staff at 162 shelters citywide have been trained on the new protocol. In the first half of 2018, ACS is helping launch an innovative new model for providing comprehensive, community-focused support to families known as Family Enrichment Centers, or, or FECs. FEC is a family-centered primary prevention strategy that is designed to reduce rates of child maltreatment and increase family stability and well-being. Everything about each center, from the name to the physical layout to the services offered, is co-designed with families in the community. The FECs are open to all families in their communities and will provide a range of two-generation services that support healthy child development. Because the design of each center is community driven, they're an important vehicle for helping children and families thrive. In communities with large immigrant populations, we expect our family enrichment centers to mirror the needs of the community and therefore to help immigrant parents locate and access the resources they need to succeed. The first pilot center is now open in the Hunts Point neighborhood of the Bronx and two additional pilot centers will be located in the Bronx and Brooklyn. The Community Partnership Programs is ACS's first funded community-based initiative committed to partnering with local communities in key aspects of the agency's work. The program embodies a commitment to the children, youth, and families of New York City, a commitment that is shared by both the city and local communities. Community partnerships serve as ambassadors to the community, advocates for families, and advisors to ACS and the city. The program focuses on community organizing, community education and capacity building, recruiting and training community leaders, managing community coalitions or partnerships, and engaging children, youth, or families in social service programs. CPPs are vital to ACS's work to build strong, meaningful relationships <clears throat> with the most vulnerable communities, including immigrant parents of young children. In closing, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss some of the many ways ACS supports families in New York City. ACS is deeply committed to providing high quality programs and services to meet the needs of all families in the city, including immigrant populations. ACS is grateful for the support of the council in this mission, and we look forward to further cultivating our partnership with you to carry out this important work. Thank you for that testimony. And right there. Yep. Good afternoon. I'm Chairperson Menchaca, I'm members of the City Council Immigration Committee here today. My name is Maite Junco, Senior Advisor to the Chancellor for Communications and External Affairs. In this role, I oversee the Office of Translation and Interpretation. Seated with me is John Tritt, Executive Director of Outreach for the DOE's Division of Early Childhood Education. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the DOE's work to support our youngest learners and their families. Before I talk about our services, I want to reiterate that all children have a right to attend public school, including 3K and pre-K, regardless of immigration status of na national or origin. 
We do not collect information on immigration status of students or their family members. We are fortunate to live in a city built by immigrants and to have school system that reflects this rich cultural and linguistic diversity. Our parents speak over 180 languages, with 41 of them speaking a language other than English at home. The DOE offers a wide range of supports for immigrant pre-K and 3K parents and parents with limited English proficiency, proficiency, including multilingual and culturally competent enrollment outreach and language services. As part of this administration's equity and excellence for all agenda, our schools are starting earlier with free full day high quality education for three year olds and four year olds through 3K for all and pre-K for all. With your support, the council, this school year, approximately 68,000 children are enrolling pre-K, more than three times the number of kids enrolled before the expansion. The administration's 3K for All initiative, launched last September in the South Bronx District 7 and Brownsville District 23, and expanding to four more districts this coming fall, is building on the success of pre-K for All and providing New York City children a continuum of early care and education. As you know, um, ACS Early Learn New York City contracts, contract will be transferred and integrated into the DOE's Division of Early Childhood Education in 2009 as part of Mayor de Blasio's commitment to early education, like Lorelei say. This integration will build on the important work done by Early Learn New York City programs today, strengthening birth to five care and education in New York City and creating a more seamless experience for children and families into elementary school and beyond. The pre-K outreach team executes a thoughtful strategy combining grassroots outreach, phone calls, and facilitated enrollment to support patterns in the 3K and pre-K processes. To meet the needs of all families, the outreach team mobilizes existing DOE resources and leverage interagency partnerships to recruit and enroll children in 3K and pre-K in every community across the city. Specialist host events and training, phone banks, canvas, recruit volunteers, and lead visibility events. Enrollment specialists also develop and execute outreach strategies specific to each community, accounting for the context of the families they serve. Each year, the outreach team attends over 1,200 events across the city, including many organized by community-based organizations. Outreach team staff members speak at least a dozen languages other than English, including Espanol, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Fujianese, Urdu, Hindi, Arabic, Russian, Haitian Creole, and French. Many of the members of the teams are immigrants themselves. In addition, the outreach team works closely with immigra immigration advocacy groups across the city, many of them here, including Make the Road New York and the Hispanic Federation. Last fall, we collaborated with the New York City Immigration Coalition on the launch of a new program called Linking Immigrant Families to Early Childhood Education or LIFE Project. The goal of the project is to improve immigrant families' access to pre-K and other childhood programs. Four CBOs were selected to conduct direct outreach in target neighborhoods around the city and develop recommendations to remove barriers to entry. As part of our commitment to engage our diverse families, we have significantly expanded and improved language access services for the 41% of parents who speak a language other than English at home. The DOE offers free access to over the phone interpretation services in over 200 languages for staff to communicate with 3K and pre-K for all families who speak a language other than English at home. Program staff can use the service when a parent or guardian calls or visits a school or program, or a program calls a parent or guardian. Social workers may also utilize this service in their work with families. Last school year, the use of over the phone interpretation services tripled to around 50,000, to a record 53,000, 53, around 53,000 calls from um, nearly 17,000 during the, the prior year. To raise awareness of language access services across our school this school year and last, we had a multilingual subway ad campaign that reminded parents at New York City Public Schools speak their language. In the 2018-19 school year, we will offer a total of 63 pre-K dual language programs and increase from the 30 current programs. The expansion of pre-K dual language classes in every borough is part of the city's effort to bring bilingual education to more students. Following the expansion, we will offer pre-K dual language in five languages, Spanish, Mandarin, and Italian, as well as the city's fir ev first ever Bengali pre-K dual language program at the Ezra Jacks Kids Pre-K Center in Queens, and the first ever Russian pre-K dual language program at PS 145 in Manhattan. 
Dual language classes are comprised of 50% children whose home language is not English and 50% English proficient students. Instruction is held in both languages with the goal of teaching students to be bilingual and literate. Students in pre-K dual language classes will be able to continue on the dual language track in kindergarten and beyond. To conclude, I want to remind the committee that last year the Chancellor and the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs wrote to DOE families on various occasions reaffirming our commitment to protecting the right of every student in New York City to attend public school regardless of immigration status. We also issued guidance to protect students and family if federal agents visit a school. We do not permit non-local law enforcement agents, including immigration and custom informants of enforcement officials to enter schools except when absolutely required by law. And we do not release student information unless absolutely required to by law. We partner with Moya to offer lawyer rights workshops in schools for students, parents, and community members. This year, we sent a poster to all schools reminding students and families that New York City is a city of immigrants, that every child has the right to a high, po high quality public education, and that we are committed to protecting that right. Public schools are at the center of our democracy, and New York City should remain sh schools remain safe places for all students, families, and educators. Ensuring that parents are partners in their child's education is a top priority, and we will continue to improve and expand our services. Thank you, and now we're ready for questions. Thank you for your testimony, all of you for testifying today. Um, each of your agencies, I think, gave an incredibly impressive array of programs that are not only focused on important needs, but are understood as, as an immigrant-friendly program for our immigrant families. And that is, um, that's something we're going to want to talk a little bit more about and, and digest together. I have a couple questions that I want to hand them over to, and then hand over the mic over to uh, the members. We have a really busy day today, a lot of different uh, hearings, and I want to say thank you, everyone. We moved from the chambers here so that the Public Housing Committee could continue their their engagement uh, and hearing everyone that wanted to testify, and I think that was the right move, and uh, we're committed to making sure every voice is heard, including some young people that are in the, in the room as well that we heard, and we welcome that. We welcome that. That is, that is, uh, that is a beautiful thing, especially in the topic of today. So my first two questions, and then I'm going to hand it over, are are really the relationship between these agencies and the work you do. You talked a lot about, about translation services, uh, really bringing parents in. What is your relationship in the work you do for immigrants with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs? If each of you can kind of talk a little bit about your relationship, just give us a sense about um, what, that, what, that is, what that is for each of you. Uh, anyone can go first. Um, I can tell you that I that I, the DOE, but personally myself, I work very closely with Moya in um, discussing. In in um, we work constantly collaboratively with things they you know they have heard that want to run by us and that we want to work jointly in resolving or things that that have come up for us and we want to get their feedback on. Um, we're constantly I don't know in that maybe in the last two weeks I had three at least three conference calls. We meet. They also. Um, um, also sort of um, partner with some of the same advocates that we partner with and they meet and then we meet together. We have a meeting not too long ago between Moya and us and some advocates. And um, so I feel that we work very closely for me. Moya, of course, is also a great resource. Um, and so I feel like we work um, very closely and I think it is the same thing for our outreach team, right? That works very closely. We obviously partner with them for the Near Rights Forums that we did last year with a lot of your offices that we did in our schools. Um, when definitely we work together when we issue guidance for um, for schools on how to deal with enforcement, we partner on um, on flyers, on translation resources, on a whole bunch of things. So I feel that we work very closely together. I mean, the same is true for ACS. Um, we really see Moya as a tremendous resource for the work that we do, um, building the capacity, you know, of the agency to better serve um, children and families from immigrant, you know, populations, and so. I think kind of the short answer to that is that they are just a tremendous resource to us and we're in constant communication with them um, around, you know, a variety of issues. Uh, 
and I'll reiterate what my colleague said, that we have uh, constant communication with Moya around the work that we're doing um, to, to really address the issues and really kind of share information of what we're learning, what, what information they have access to. So I would say a real exchange and constant communication and collaboration. And you mentioned at the beginning of the hearing the local law and the task force. Um, and so we look forward to that um, building on the foundation that already exists and to growing that collaboration and communication. Have any of you assembled into this, task, into this task force? Is that at all in, in progress, or I should say in motion? Have, have you met as a task force? I think we're looking forward to convening. OK, so it, it hasn't happened yet, but, yeah. but you're looking forward to convening. Yes. OK, I'm going to pause, it, pause here and hand it over to uh, Councilmember Jonai, who joins us from the Bronx and member of this committee. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for consideration. I have another hearing going on simultaneously. First of all, I just want to commend you on the dual language school. Um, I am fortunate enough and proud to announce that beginning this fall, we're going to have the first Albanian dual language school in New oh. York City. <laughs> I You're can't help it. It's, it's one of those things that's difficult to contain. I'm just so excited and being uh, the first Albanian elected in the state uh, is just an incredible day for uh, me and the community, so I'm grateful to you. My question's in around the 3PK and 4PK. Um, where are we on our program goals and um, services that are being offered with both of those initiatives? So I, I'd say overall with, uh, with- Can you introduce yourself? Oh, quick? yeah, sorry. My name is John Tritt. I'm the Executive Director of Outreach in the Division of Early Childhood Education at the DOE. And so I have a team of 40 enrollment specialists who uh, spread out all across New York City to educate families about, the pre about pre-K for all and now about 3K for all and early learning services that are available to them. Um, and so what we th what, when it comes to the, the pre-K for all program, which is what we, you know, the four-year-olds program that, is, that, that expanded in 2014, we feel like we're at scale. Um, we're always looking for new families. We're always trying to identify that next cohort of new families coming up for the upcoming school year because they're brand new to the system. Um, and so that, you know, that we feel like we've, we've fully expanded there. Um, but with the 3K for All program, the universal three-year-olds program, um, that is going to be rolled out two districts per year um, over the next four years until 2020. And then we hope to go citywide the following year. This year we added additional districts, so districts five and 16. Um, were added additionally. So in fact, while I'm here, my team, my entire team is up on the ground in District 5 right now knocking on NYCHA doors to get the word out to make sure folks uh, are aware of the 3K deadline coming up on May 11th. So that is being rolled out over the next few years, um, and we feel that uh, we think the participation will be around 90% of what the full four-year-olds program will be because, you know, the kids are a little smaller, um, so that's, that, that's kind of where we think we'll end up there. If I can just be as so bold to say four years is a little bit too long. I think there are so many families that are out there that would be um, so gracious to be able to enroll in the 3PK program and whatever we can do for a universal pro uh, an approach, uh, we would be supportive of. I think all of my colleagues in this entire body uh, understands the importance of early education um, and whatever it would take uh, financially and otherwise, I think we'd be here. And, We'd be willing to knock on some of those doors to make sure those uh, families are enrolling. What additional services are provided in pre-K and 3PK program for students with developmental delays and undiagnosed uh, conditions? Or because it's such an early age, it's sometimes difficult uh, to identify some of the uh, disabilities that uh, exist. Are there um, criterias and per safety nets in place that would help determine any of these conditions? Like I, I could say, and then if anyone would like to jump in, I think you know that one of the, the values of having early childhood education and these programs is so that these things can be identified, that these, these um, children who might otherwise be at home or in a different setting uh, will be with a trained early childhood educator who can help identify those and work with early intervention and work with CPSE to make sure that those um, this, any developmental delay or any learning disabilities identified and appropriately addressed. 
I, I want to ask a more direct question. Do we have the expertise in those classrooms that can identify conditions that would go unnoticed to a family, a young family? I, if I, I can add to that. Um, so um, in the early learn programs, which you know provide services for children from six weeks through five years, um, it's a requirement that all children are screened within the first 45 days of entering the program. So that is a requirement. All of our programs do that. We hold them to that. Once they are screened, if there are any issues or concerns that come up, a conversation is had with the parents and then children are referred to services. Thank you so much. And I just want to commend you on doing God's work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Joe Nye uh, from the Bronx, and really looking forward to the official announcements of, of this incredible program. And as the, as the first and only Mexican elected in the state uh, of New York as well, I, I commend you on your work, uh, Councilmember Joe Nye. You, you have a big responsibility, and I'm glad we're doing that together, making sure we get everyone served. Thank you. I'm gonna, uh, because we're on, on, on pre-K, pre I'm gonna hand this over now to Councilmember Holden from from Queens, uh, he has some questions on pre-K as well. And, and I just wanna let everybody know, this is the first time we've actually had a public hearing around UPK. As much as we are so thankful and proud as a city to be working on this together, uh, this is the first time we're actually having a public, public hearing on it. And it's, I think, a great testament to the work that we do for our immigrant families that it's happening here in this committee. But really, this is for everyone. So thank you, and uh, I'll hand it over now to uh, Thank you Holden. all for your testimony. I, I just want to talk about the, um, the 3K, just a few questions. Um, I, you know, who's you know, who decided on the, um, the districts? Because I, I have one of the most diverse districts, 24. It's in Queens. Large immigrant populations. And I don't, you know, just looking, just hearing all the testimonies, I didn't hear the word Queens that often uh, for all the programs. I'm hearing, you know, Brooklyn a lot. I hear the Bronx. Um, I have a very diverse uh, population. And I'm just worried that we'll miss the, the boat on the, um, the 3K, that some, many of my family's immigrant populations will, will not be served by 3K. And their kids will grow out of, the, out of that area. And they're, if they're zero, you know, they're one or two years old now, we're going to miss the boat. So I just want, is there a plan on when to roll this out? And um, is there a plan on district? So I can know in advance, tell, tell my population and my constituents that you'll get 3K 2019, 2020, 21. Do we have a plan on that? Thanks, council member. Um, we certainly do have a plan on that. Uh, well, I first want to say, start off by saying we're happy to note that one of the 3K districts that is um, online for the coming school year is District 27 in Queens. So uh, we do have one of, the, one of the first school districts to have the universal 3K program is in Queens. Um, and it's absolutely uh, uh, the mission to make this a citywide initiative and expend, uh, go to all five boroughs. So. Um, in as far as the plan for what districts are coming online over the next few years, uh, we'd be happy to make sure that your, your team and your staff has all the information. It's online right now. I would encourage anybody who has a question to, to wants to see the districts, you can just go to nyc.gov 3K, and it lists all the districts and what year they're coming online. As far as identifying which districts um, were chosen first, there was a, a bunch of considerations. You know, we would like to make this happen yeah. as fast as possible, but in order to make the universal force program pre-K for all possible, it required a tremendous amount of space. Um, and so that's a big consideration in terms of the rollout over these next few years is making sure that we have space available when it's an announced in, in for each district. Um, so that was one consideration. And then, you know, like in, in the first two districts that were announced, District 7 and 23, they had single shepherd programs, which was an initiative that would pair a social worker with a family throughout their education continuum. Um, and that was one of the factors to, to make 3K success from the beginning, to have that program aligned with it. And so, you know, space, making sure there's funding, making sure that, um, you know, that rollout happens is, is what were big considerations. But it's happening in Queens for the coming school year. We're taking applications in District 27 um, right now until May 11th. Um, and the goal and the plan absolutely is to make this citywide. And, and the strategy behind only going within the district, that means not, I mean, I'm, I'm sure 3K would help 
the immigrant population, and maybe we can target the, the immigrant population areas rather than by district, like my school district, 24, and I understand the hurdles. We're one of the most overcrowded, if not the most overcrowded in the city of New York. However, that kind of penalizes us again because we don't have the space that not only are we penalized in the classroom with a larger class size or larger schools and lack of space, but then we don't get the pre-K because of the space situation. So I think that needs to be looked at. And, and certainly, we'll, I'll, I'd like to talk to you about, and I'll go to that site to see when 24 gets online. But it, it just seems that in Queens, cultural uh, uh, programs um, and, and other areas are where the, we're the last to get them. And, and I really. Uh, and this is this is what I'm concerned about. And and, and by the way, I want to applaud the mayor for three K. I think it's a great idea. It, it is certainly um, gives us some hope. I, I just I, I'm just concerned about the families that will miss the boat on it. But um, so I would recommend that some of the maybe there could be a pilot program targeted the the immigrant population to really help them out because they have certainly the mo most hurdles. Um, and three K would would be great in in those areas. So I would look at that. Um, I also want to push the dual language because I uh, program, which I think all our kids should be exposed to. Not only, uh, you know, I think if English is your first language, you should be exposed to a dual language uh, program. And I didn't hear Polish in, in that in any of the testimony. Is Polish? Because uh, I have a large Polish immigrant population that um, they would certainly benefit from um, a dual language uh, program. I, is that being considered? In DOE? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where it's already there, where there is already a program, so I, I you know, I have to check. I did, did want to come back just for a second for something you said earlier, that even though it's on, it's on District 27, the 3K program is not sown, and so families can apply to the seats that are in District 27, right, John? Is that? I have a little piece of 27, okay. just a very <laughs> small piece. Right. And I <laughs> think Lorelei wanted to add something, but on the Polish right. we'll check, and maybe while I'm here, someone will check, and I'll let you know. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we have a, a good number of seats in Queens that are early learn seats. So those are seats that are reserved How many? for... I don't have the number off can we get my that? Head, can we, we get can both of those in yeah, we can Right now we can just get on our yep, phones and we can ask. certainly get that number for you. And we those have two, the, both. so just to clear, the, the numbers for the Queens seats and then whether or not we have Polish, that would be great to get. Yes, and I, I, to the Polish question, um, I just wanted to share that ACS is going to be um, coming up in the fiscal year 19. Um, we are actually translating all of our documents into Polish. So we're adding that. There we go. That. Bingo. Okay. That was <laughs> we easy, are doing right? One, we are doing a, an experimental program in dual language Polish in PS71, which is in my district. Uh, I went out there. 125 parents were in the room, many of them Polish, but there were a lot of people just wanted to, you know, their kids to learn another language. And I think most countries do that. They actually teach multiple languages. In this country, and certainly New York City should lead the way in this, we should teach all our children two languages, at least two languages. And, uh, and the, when's the best time to do that, right? Until, under the age of five is, is best. So if we can work that as a, as a, a program within every school, I know it's a challenge, but I think we could at least offer it. And most parents, I, I think many parents would, would, um, would be thrilled. So um, I, again, like I want to appreciate, I appreciate the mayor's, um, and by the way, a shout out to Commissioner Hansel, who's do, doing a wonderful job at ACS. Turn that, that agency around, I appreciate it, and um, gave great testimony at our committee um, uh, last month. Uh, 20 pages of testimony, which was wonderful, but it was just, it was great. Uh, that guy must be exhausted, um, but he's he's done a terrific job, and um, I want to commend him for turning that whole agency around and really um, doing an outstanding job. Um, I, I I just um, in the because um, you know we we were the last twenty four was also one of the last to get the uh, um, the pre K. We had we had the challenges of space so. I think we really need, if I could sit down with, um, with DOE and, and work out possible sites um, that we can identify. We do have some uh, areas that we could expand um, um, the DOE and possibly um, uh, 3K, because I'd, I'd like to plan for the future and not wait, and then we're, we, you know, we, the rollout, I just have a feeling we might be 
down the list. Uh, and I, I don't, if, unless you have access to that, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to work with you guys about finding locations for, for 3K. Uh, we'd be happy to have that meeting with you to sit Great. down. Um, I'll connect you with the expansion team in the early childhood um, division. Um, and also, in the meantime, you know, during that meeting and setting it up and afterwards, um, I want to make sure that you have all my contact information so that my team can assist your constituents now um, in connecting with programs that might be available, and certainly um, early learn programs that are available in the community now. If they're eligible, we want to make sure that those families can get connected. So happy to make sure that happens too. But just a question on, on district. Um, would you consider some, some pilot sites? Let's say you're going to roll out in the district. You, you tend to, I mean, I'm looking at the map, and there tends to be, they're clustered really tight, and I understand that. Um, where the 3Ks are now or plan to be. Um, but would you consider, I mean, is it, are you guys open to some just pilot programs, like one or two in a, in a district at a time, rather than the cluster that you have? I know, I know that's the plan, but I know maybe you I, can't commit to that. I, I'll certainly <laughs> take the idea back. Yeah, I, okay, I, all right. I think we're, we're, you know, we like to think creatively, we'll take any yeah. idea back for yeah, sure. Thank, thanks yeah, thanks so much, okay. Yeah. And let us know if you ha when you get the answers to those questions. Uh, we'll we'll pause and, and get to them. Uh, I want to hand it over to Councilman from Brooklyn, Cal Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just have a few questions for ACS. Uh, not to pick on you, but uh, find you most interesting sometimes. Um, you you talked about uh, that ACS has certified 180 UNT visas in the last eight months, I believe. I'm wondering if you can give us a bigger understanding of the numbers in more than just the window of the last eight months, first of all, so if you can give us like the last year. But secondly, can you uh, sort of uh, contrast that with what the number of applications for certification you've received so that we can understand what that 180 uh, really represents? So you, have you gotten 20,000 applications or 200? And then the third part of that, I'm gonna give it to you all in one piece because uh, they don't may enter uh, relate with it one another, is uh, do you track these uh, grants of certification for success? Because, you know, obviously we know that uh, uh, the immigration system is a little different perhaps in the last year and a half, I think to say the least, and I'm curious if there's some kind of uh, metrics that you can share with us whether or not these 180 that you've granted uh, are working. So all of your questions are a little out of my personal depth of knowledge, um, uh, but we will certainly kind of com come back to your office with answers to those questions. Okay, and please share them with our chair as well. Yep. And I think that's something that uh, we're very interested in. I um, wanted to ask you uh, about uh, the, the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing's work. Um, <coughs> you, you specifically mentioned it aims to engage families before they ever reach the child welfare system. Um, does, does ACS have a system or process in place to um, when, when families come into the system, whether they're already at an Article 10 proceeding or a little bit before that, to make sure that they're getting a caseworker who can understand the specific natures of different uh, um, ethnicities and different backgrounds. And, um, because you know, we know that you know, New York City, it's the giant melting pot, and people who are new here kind of have different ways that may not be understood by, you know, let's be frank, somebody who was born and bred in New York City and got a great master's degree in social work but may just really not understand uh, the nuances of particular uh, upbringings and particular traditions and whether or not there's some kind of way that you have to match caseworkers either by ethnicity or at least by an understanding of ethnicity. So, um, so our caseworkers are um, based in, are, are borough based and um, you know, we, we try our best to reflect the communities that we're serving. Um, and I would say that that's not just the case in the child welfare system, that's the case throughout ACS. So for example, our child care programs that are based all across the city really, uh, for the most part, are hiring from the community. So you will almost likely always have people who speak the dominant language of that community. Um, we also have um, community partnership programs and family enrichment centers that are also embedded in the community and um, reflect the culture and the language of the communities of the communities that they're serving. Okay, I, my my, <coughs> and I appreciate all that and I understand that. But my biggest concern, and I, I guess this is where I'm really targeting this question, is when when a case gets to the point where it's either immediately 
before an Article 10 or around that point, um, there's, you know, what's, what may sound like an Article 10 proceeding in, in the way where we may look at it as New Yorkers may just be a caseworker misunderstanding something um, and not really getting it. And are we taking a second look when we know there's a language barrier, when we know there's an ethnicity barrier, someone's a very recent immigrant and they're coming from a place far away, um, uh, they just you know, may have different norms than we have, may, different cultural norms. Are we looking to make sure that the caseworkers, it's not just about whether or not they're from the borough or whether or not they know the community, but whether or not they actually understand the different cultures. So I'd like to give you kind of a very thorough response to that. And because I don't work on the child welfare side of ACS, um, I'd like to defer our response um, to give us an opportunity to come back to you with a very thorough I tr response. I trust you will. No, thank you. Um, and, I, and I believe you will. And I think that's, a, that's it's just important. And if you don't, and, and you know, there's just something to look at as you, as you develop ACS into a stronger, I know, you know we've had challenges with ACS. Uh, in the 90s, you know, I always, I always joke about uh, uh, government has sort of two, uh, two ways to deal with the crisis and management of agencies, either combine them or rip them apart. In the 90s, we saw ACS separate itself from, uh, uh, from, HRA. from the HRA uh, DSS, and then we kind of see it getting back together. And uh, in the 90s, it was called Bureau of Child Welfare, and it was a whole different entity, and, but it was part of the larger organization. And today, we're seeing that the model may be putting it back as part of the larger organization. I don't know what the right answer is, but what I do want to make sure is that ultimately when, when families en enter into that system, sometimes there's no exit. Um, and that's, uh, that's a big concern of mine because frankly, these are, these, you know, that's, that's the last uh, part of that fabric of the family that's getting ripped apart. And uh, by the time that the, the, the Bureau, the ACS is actually involved, it may not be, uh, there may no longer be an ability to put it back together. And it may just really be misunderstandings that can be uh, explained rather easily if somebody just quite frankly comprehends uh, the different cultural norms. Um, I wanted to talk briefly, uh, and very briefly, I'm just gonna ask if you, if you know. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, vouchers that parents may use to purchase care in a variety of settings. That's something that this council, long before I joined uh, a little over 100 days ago, uh, has been pushing for uh, every year, uh, going back as far as uh, Mayor Giuliani, um, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, this mayor's been fantastic on it. There's always been this battle, right? It doesn't show up in the preliminary budget. There's this whole give us, give us, give us, and then you know it shows up. Uh, Councilman Menchaca has been uh, protesting on this for the last four years that he's been been in the council, and this is you know there's always this dance. So my question is a, I guess it's a several fold question. Number one is uh, does does ACS recognize the importance of these? Obviously, the answer to that is yes, so it's rhetorical in nature. But uh, is ACS looking to expand uh, the use of vouchers for child care? And the reason I'm asking specifically is because, as you know, uh, this is your profession, um, the provision of child care is really that, that, that piece that enables a family to lift itself up out of uh, complete and abject poverty into perhaps approaching the middle class. Because if they don't have the child care, they can't go out and get a job. And so, and there's, there's no option. It's either the child care or, or, or not having the child care. And so if ACS would just, you know, notch up those vouchers a little bit and enable more and more families to take advantage of it, we would see more people being able to get into professions and going out there and getting jobs, which is ultimately our goal, right? Because we don't want to hold their hands forever. We want to lift them up and put them out there on their own and let those families live. So you are preaching to the converted right okay. here. No. Um, and um, I will tell you, you know, you said this is, you know, your profession. It is my profession. And, um, you know, I am honored to work for an administration that really values early childhood the way this administration Very does. Very much so. And That's has correct. made significant investments in early childhood the way this administration has. So I will say that. Um, um, you know, there's always thinking that's going on around what can we do better, what can we do more of, um, how can we change it so that there's better access, um, and so there's always constant thinking around that. Okay, I mean, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think the record is very clear that uh, this administration did not, uh, did not make the council do the dancing uh, that previous administrations had done. 
of the, you know, we're going to take it out, we're going to put it back in, we're going to yell about it, and then, you know, wink, nod, it was never going to be gone in the first place. But what the administration can do is, in addition to baselining it into the budget so that there's never this dance, but just actually recognizing the numbers need to increase because you know what the numbers of people who do need the child care are in the city. And um, maybe we can't get everywhere, but if we can up and buy a couple of thousand a year to the point where we're actually being able to really address the problems, I think that would be important. Thank you for that. I'll take that back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Yeager from, from Brooklyn, my neighbor. Um, and and I think that what, what I want to start uh, my line of questions is in that in that respect, a, a real sense of, of kind of commitment to uh, kind of removing this, this back and forth and really kind of getting down to understand how we can actually uh, make some differences without having to negotiate them. There are some things in the budget that are in negotiation right now. So there is still somewhat of a dance in some ways. But, we, but what I want to do is really concentrate on our relationship with Moya, uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And you know we turn to Moya for so much uh, in this committee and in this council for information, for real understanding of what's happening. And as the office of mayor, uh, the mayor's office, uh, they get to work with you. Uh, this task force was created for that. And they serve as a clearinghouse for this information. And so I, what I want to do is get a little bit more information about how these issues, as each of you presented today so beautifully on expertise on the ground doing this work, how how that gets how that gets relayed. I want to get a sense about how that gets relayed back to the mayor's office. Some of it I'm hearing is is in moments of crisis or you know so we got to solve a problem and problem solving. But where is it just the natural sense of continued relationship and communication, um, especially when the agency, your agencies, present get get presented with data that kind of spikes up as an issue. Uh, I'm thinking about higher rates of health concerns. Uh, maybe you're seeing some stuff in, in requests for dual language. Whatever, whatever it is, how does, that, how does that work and percolate in relationship? And if you, each of you can kind of talk a little bit about it, it'd be great uh, for us here at the committee. So thank you for that question. I think um, one entity out of the mayor's office that we haven't talked about yet today, but really all our agencies have been very much involved with and continue to be involved with is the Children's Cabinet, which um, really brings the city agencies that are working with children, um, and this goes beyond the, the birth to five that we're talking about today, um, to really coordinate, align, and think both at the programmatic level, level, but also think systematically about what we're doing and how we can do it better. And that's an existing cabinet of agencies that come together and talk about children. Correct. Okay, cool. Anybody else wants to kind of answer about how, how uh, again, with the, with the idea of, of like a trend spikes all of a sudden that, that uh, has to do with the immigrant community, what, what happens? I'm trying to think of some of the examples, um, but for example, when the president came out on the DACA, right, saying like, um, basically saying that the, you know, it was likely to be an end to the DACA program in September, we immediately got in a call, not only with the DOE, but there were other agencies, of course, as we first wanted, you know, step by step, right, wanted to get out information to our families and to other families citywide, um, what we're gonna say, sort of run, the, what we're gonna do and work very closely together. Together we decided to send a letter to parents, to send a letter to school parents, basically saying we're aware of this. The letter was signed by both the Moya Commissioner and the Chancellor. Um, and as I said on the, um, the protocols around immigration and about what we're gonna do if a federal agent and an immigration officer shows up in one of our schools, I just feel that the communication with us is very ongoing, it's constant, and um, I work very closely with, you know, Vida, you know, Kavita and Vita and this, right? Um, well, you had a concern recently, you went to them, we talked, we solved it. Um, so I think it's pretty close, and we're looking forward to um, to the gathering of the task force that is, you know, per the get that we're starting, and I think that will provide just a more official setting. But I think uh, the the communication is mm -hmm. really open between us. Let's talk a little bit about stigma. Uh, so some of the some of the things that came up in testimony today, uh, 
and and are just present in our communities, especially in immigrant immigrant communities. Uh, things like postpartum depression, things like uh, mental health services and counseling needs, special education plans. Uh, there's stigma that exists within that category of of, of concern, p public health, and what what are agencies kind of doing and in partnership with Moya about about those stigmas? So um, through Thrive NYC, depression screenings are now a routine part of care for pregnant women and new moms at prenatal clinics at 12 New York City health and hospital sites, including 11 hospitals and New York City health and hospitals Gotham Health, um, Gouverneur, a large community health center on the Lower East Side. Um, in your question about mental health services more broadly, um, there are a number of fronts to address mental health treatment and health care access for New Yorkers, including initiatives like the Mental Health Service Corps, which places early career social workers and psychologists in behavioral health and primary care settings. And anyone in the city can call or text chat um, NYC Well at 1-888-NYC-WELL, regardless of age or immigration status, 24-7, 365 days a year to find services. NYC Well is free, confidential, and available in two, over 200 languages. So a lot of this work um, sometimes happens um, somewhat organically. I'll share um, a quick story. I was visiting one of my programs um, in the Bronx uh, last week. And um, you know the director shared with me that you know immigration is a, is a is a significant issue for the population there, and she had a parent who just really passed out um, because she had to um, go to a federal office, um, and she was going there after she had dropped off her child, and she was afraid that she would never see her child again. So these are very real issues that our families are dealing with every single day, and so part of the work that we do, you know, in that conversation. I'm referring her to the resources and making sure that they're connected to the mental health resources and the Thrive funded resources that are available in their community. Um, also making sure that they have access to immigration resources in their community. And then coming back and making sure that we incorporate language and access to those resources in the newsletters that we push out to the programs. Because we're not, you know, I'm not out at every single program, but when I have those conversations and these issues kind of bubble up, we want to make sure we know that other families are dealing with the same issues. And so we push that out in communication to our directors um, and other leaders in the community. The, so let's talk about that stress. That's real. And I think it was in, in my opening statement, you all referred to it as well. The researchers at the center of uh, or for the developing child at Harvard University have found that the toxic stress can have impacts on child development. Um, and all we have to do is point at the federal government right now. Um, is DOHMH's early intervention program aware of this heightened risk of development delays? You know, is it integrated in the kind of work that you do in, uh, in your, say, your curriculum of, of understanding? Um, and what are, we, what are we doing about it? And has it changed over time? Uh, and if, if, that, if this is at all impacting DOE or ACS, I like to hear that too, but really kind of thinking about um, any adjustments that DOHMH has, has made to ensure that immigrant communities receive the kind of a real appropriate uh, assistance. Mm -hmm. So it most certainly is integrated into the work, not only of our early intervention program, but other child and family facing services and programs and resources that we provide across the agency. Um, it's, it's really an effort of the unit that I lead, the Early Childhood Health and Development Unit. And so this Here For You campaign that we had last summer was really focused on helping to promote that information. The Parents Connect groups that I also referenced in my testimony are another way that we really reach out to p parents at a neighborhood level. And um, you know those were formed based on feedback that we received from them of wanting to have a space where they could come together and individuals who could relate to them, that they can talk with one another. I think it's a real indication of the lack of supports that parents across the city feel and we heard that across the city from parents from all different types of, of backgrounds and so that idea of how do we integrate that and how do we continue to provide that research that we know is most relevant I think the other piece related to this that I think of is 
adverse childhood experiences, which some of my colleagues referenced, um, you referenced in your introductory remarks as well, and how can we really think about that as part of our work and really critical to our work and integrate it across the work that we're doing. And I, I just want to add to that, um, um, a couple of years ago through the First Ladies Thrive NYC initiative, ACS implemented a model called Trauma Smart. And um, we are implementing that model over a four year period. We are training um, a, close to 100 programs annually over the course of four years. Not only training them monthly, we're training you know, the, the providers, so the staff, all staff in those centers. Um, and we're, then we're going on site and we're providing on site coaching around creating a trauma informed culture in our childcare centers. And so, you know, I want to thank the First Lady for recognizing the impact of toxic stress in our communities and the value of creating a trauma-informed culture in our early childhood centers. I also want to add that part of the new division of child and family well-being, part of the goal of our work there is really to increase access to protective factors in our communities, you know, so that we are able to reduce a scores among children so that we are able to help parents mitigate stressors that they face because we think if we're able to do that then we will come to a place where we're seeing child and family well-being are you seeing trends being impacted by by this work already so we we so the new division was launched in uh september of 2017 um so it hasn't even been a full year uh, but we are, and you know, we're focusing this work through our place-based um, initiatives, which are the family enrichment centers, and um, the community partnership programs, um, and even through our childcare programs. Um, the work that we're, we've done with Trauma Smart, we have seen some very positive results. I mean, what we see from the providers who have gone through um, the full, you know, training. We just have one cohort who've done who have done the whole thing. We're in year two now. Um, so we're not complete with year two, but they have a better understanding of how to um, engage families, of how to change the question from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you. Um, the immigration process itself can be a traumatic process, and living cautiously um, in New York City can also add trauma and toxic stress. So the, um, this is your second cohort for that one program. Uh, are any of the providers here, are, are any providers here that have gone through that program? Just curious. I don't think we have any providers here. Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk to some of them too, just to get that, that sense. Because uh, I think it's a pretty powerful re, uh, restructuring of, of delivery of services. Um, we, so speaking of trauma, one of the bigger traumas that, that we're experiencing every day, especially for our uh, high population, high immigrant population districts are deportation, deportations. And members in our community that find themselves in a deportation proceeding. Yes, we have services, legal services. Uh, thank you to the city of New York and its partnership are really offering everyone uh, legal services if they find themselves in deportation proceeding. Um, but what happens now to the family that is now in the middle of that deportation proceeding? And if you can think about it through your agency lenses, what are, what are you all doing to support those families in that moment where they lose one of their, their parents? Mainly and mostly, uh, they're losing the breadwinners of the family, uh, thinking about rapid response, thinking about advanced safety planning, long-term support. How, how are each of you thinking about those? those questions and that, that impact to the family? I would say one of the beauties of the home visiting programs that we have through DOHMH is that they, uh, the home visitors, whether they're nurses or home visitors in our newborn home visiting program, they develop tremendous relationships with families and really connecting them with additional supports that go above and beyond what um, is provided in the context of the program themselves. And so I think, you know, really thinking about the, the critical nature and the importance of those relationships and the connections that then also those programs have with others in the community who can provide that ongoing connection and support and additional support and resources as necessary is, is really critical. Um, 
we at ACS um, connect our families with um, free, high quality immigration legal services via provider partners. So those provider partners can include um, legal aid, the door, sanctuary for families, lawyers for children, um, to ensure that they have access to services to help them through that process. Um, you know, I'll share um, kind of another anecdote in visiting um, one of my providers um, who um, is in Chinatown. They were, they made sure to launch a Know Your Rights campaign and um, they were educating families um, around their rights in case um, someone showed up at their door. Um, and they were um, connecting families um, who were engaged in that process um, with legal support. So that's the legal stuff, right? That's we're, we're all working on the legal stuff. But I guess I'm, I'm talking about everything else that is within the purview of your agency. Uh, are, are there plans? Are there rapid response plans? Uh, I guess I was looking more for more than just legal services. Uh, I, I listen to what you guys think, but I just wanted to say that um, we saw some of this and some of the advocates raised this to us that um, w w in the letters that we did to families, we asked them to update the information, the contact information to add people beyond the parents because we had heard anecdotes also of parents being afraid that something happened to them and who's gonna pick up their children and to create a plan of support to pick up their children, right, who was gonna pick up their children to make sure that there was some sort of continuity, right, if they were, if something like that happened to them. Um, I think for, uh, so that was important to us. Information has been very important to us to let parents know here are the resources, to let principals know, to let educators know. These are the things that are going to this family's mind. The, the, ch the child might be, you know, a, res a, a citizen, but the parents are not, and these are sort of what's in, in everyone, it's in everyone family's mind, and so that's why also we, we did the Know Your Rights Forum, which is more legal, but also other supports are offered to that, and um, um, and and also when well when it comes to something more legal, we of course refer to Moya and Moya than what we were just talking about here. In our we also of course have our social workers in our schools that deal with this and other trauma um, as it comes. And and I think what what um, just to kind of finish this set of questions, but I want to I want to really follow up with all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about how and when we engage our families at different points. That might start with a, a house visit. That is a planned visit for um, a planned visit that is for uh, a, a kind of review of any kind of special education needs, but could offer an opportunity for at that moment in that touch point an issue that just happened the day before where a, a mother or father was picked up by ICE, and what happens? And are our people who are constantly engaging ready to respond? Even if they're not trained to fully go through a, a need, that they can alert, understand, and be able to respond. We're touching our communities in so many different ways at all times, and we're missing opportunities. And, and I think that's, that's what I want to continue this conversation around, is, is how do we make sure that anyone who ever walks into an immigrant family home can be ready to understand and connect. And that, that, is, that would be the, 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 the secret magic sauce of, of what we do in multiple agencies and what we're going to be pushing Moya to start thinking about as our clearing house for information. And that's why I'm just really sticking here, just to really understand where, where, we're, where, where we have blind spots that are just inherent because we do the work that we do, but where we can start breaking those walls and start thinking about bridging and training all the frontline agents of our city to go and be able to be the best uh, servant possible. I think that point is is really um, well taken, and I you know I th I think that one of the most critical things that we're able to do through our work is to create safe spaces for these families, um, and relationships are critical because without the relationship, a family is not going to open up and ask for help and ask for support, and so. ACS's commitment um, through the new division, um, particularly with our family enrichment centers, and particularly through our community partnership programs, which are embedded in the community, which are really relying on the community to tell us 
What do you need? What are your needs? What can we, what services can we bring to you? Not these are the services that you need, but what do you need from us? Um, is an effort, and I see it as an investment in relationship building in these communities. We see the same thing in our child care centers. Our child care centers are safe spaces for our families. Our child care centers are places where a family feels comfortable coming in and talking, whether it's with the director or the teacher or whomever she's built a relationship with to say, this is happening to me and I need help and I need support. And so, you know, we, our job is to make sure that the people who are facing those families, the people who are facing those communities are armed with the knowledge that they need and the support that they need to make sure they can connect these families to the resources that they need. Well, and, and, on, and to that point, uh, on the mental health services, uh, a question from uh, one of the advocates is, is really, is there a list of resources that immigrant and uninsured, um, you know, immigrants so that there's no issue with status, uh, can access mental health services? It, do you have a list? Is that something that exists that, that can be shared across, across the board for, uh, for the people that we serve every day? Right, so I would say NYC Well is the primary resource to, to get that kind of information, and that's available to everyone to call, text, chat, 24-7, um, 365 days a year. So that's an opportunity, and certainly we can follow up with um, other resources that are available. Does that to work? I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm asking a, a very real question. I, I, I'm just thinking, okay, so you go to an organization, and you say, okay, go to NYC Well. And then it just doesn't, it, what does that mean? Like, is that, there's a phone, help me understand that. Just right, well, so this is, this is outside of, of my division and my work, okay. so we'll have to get back to you about the details. I know that there are details. Um, you know, there's a huge public awareness campaign to promote NYC Well that um, many people in this room may have, may have seen, um, either, you know, public service ads or on the subways, the, the ways that we promote the services as an agency that we have available. But we can certainly follow up and provide more detail about the utilization of um, NYC Well. Okay, we're, we're, we want to get back to, that, to you on that, because I think the way that organization, back to how do we ask them what they need, mm -hmm. organizations are asking us for a list, of, of a short list of, of providers, mm -hmm. and then we're going back and saying, well, there's a clearinghouse. So start here, and, and like whether or not that works is another question. But I want I want to come back to you and, and really kind of work with you and some of the organizations that are asking for that. Um, and then, on a on a note around um, the the number of people, uh, how many people are immigrants who are actually accessing vouchers? Uh, uh, specifically on the kind of thinking about transferred with, with uh, trying to understand the question actually, but how are we making sure that, that, that we understand that, that immigrant communities are being served with vouchers and how, how do we make sure that we, we're serving everybody so that everyone is, has access? So I think, you Language, know. Language, et cetera. Yeah, so there are regulations, particularly with the child care um, block grant dollars that we receive from the state, and the state receives them from the federal government, and there are regulations around that and um, immigration status. Um, so, you know, that I think continues to be a challenge. However, we're fortunate to have um, um, Head Start, a pretty significant Head Start grant in this city. Um, and our Head Start uh, programs, which again are spread throughout um, the city, do not require any type of um, uh, disclosure around immigration status. I think also this is where you know the mayor's vision around 3K and pre-K is so significant because there isn't a requirement around you know documentation of citizenship with 3K and pre-K. Um, so unfortunately, some of the services are tied to federal regulations um, around that information. I think what's what's um, what what this hearing is kind of unveiling is is a real understanding of, of how how we're actually impacting our, our immigrant families and how we're able to um, both protect them, uh, and we're doing so much right now to to protect our immigrant immigrant families um, by privacy and confidentiality and, and ensuring that we give access to them. But 
really how how do, how at what percentage uh, do immigrant communities access our health services, our school services, and and can you give us a, a texture of what that what that is from each of your uh, kind of agency perspectives? Um, I mean, I'll just say that our schools are open to all families, to all parents, regardless of immigration status. And so I, I, right. I mean, that's so sort me, of the yeah, broad, I big uh, picture. I mean, like, we're So that's the policy, right? That's like, we're open. Yeah. And then, so then how do we, how do we measure? How do we, how do we understand that, that, that our, our pre-K programs, I think you heard some of the council members saying that they might not even be aware that there's a deadline. There's, there's a lot of barriers. How are we measuring that, that feedback and response because it's yeah. one thing to I say we're we open to everybody and whether or not say, everybody comes is, is, a, is a question. I How mean, I think we're very proud, right, of the expansion of pre-K and the families who sign up, but I think John can, and, and it's, it, it is because the outreach has been so thought out and so culturally appropriate. And, in and so how, how, do you, how do you measure that success? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, we'll, I mean, we, there's a whole, we understand that there are barriers um, that people might perceive when uh, applying to a pre-K program. I mean, not the least of which for all communities across New York is the fact that we're dealing with the youngest children, right? Like this is the first time most folks are, you know, their, their child's entering. Like if they had been on a daycare or something else prior to this, they might have been in a center-based program. But for, for many, many families, this is the first time they're entering the school system. Um, and so for immigrant families and all families across New York City communities, uh, there's, there's, you know, some nerves tied to it in a lot of cases. And that's fundamentally why our team still exists po post the 2014 uh, expansion. So the outreach team was put together to help get the word out about pre-K initially when pre-K became universal. But then the administration took a look afterwards and we had to make a decision. We're at this point now where, okay, we feel like we've hit expansion. You know, we're ready for the next year. We have this great online central application process with a website. Like, do we need to keep having, you know, 40 plus human beings out across the city? And because of this issue and yes. several. Yeah, so yeah, I, I will also say yes. Um, uh, but but that's but that this issue was one of the paramount issues and making sure that immigrant families did not face a barrier um, and and so we recognize that there's fear out there we hear it anecdotally uh, uh, as individuals on the team we work very closely with advocates who kind of hear things out in the community as well and and we try to have as close relationship as possible to share that information we partner with other city agencies to ensure that we're getting all the most up-to-date information from Moya and from other folks. Um, and we're constantly evaluating what we're doing, how we're doing it, what messages are we putting out there, what languages are we putting it out there. So in our robust paid media uh, campaign this year, we were targeted, like we picked particular bus shelter languages specifically based on language data, that any language data we could get across the city. We use that to try to aggregate, like where should we put like a, a Chinese language uh, bus shelter ad? Um, and we got down to like, even though we did hundreds of bus shelters, we picked individual bus shelters based on that information. And so, you know, we, we look at a whole host of data to, to measure our success. Um, we're trying to get, you know, more and more kids every year. But, uh, you know, I mean, in short, we recognize that this is always going to be, you know, no matter what the future looks like in federal government or other things, we recognize this will always be a challenge that we need to be addressing on a human level, on the ground, person to person. And, and thank you for that. I, I think that kind of shows the not only the commitment, but the, the kind of the bro robust nature of, of and, and the longevity of that robust nature and outreach for UPK, and then now 3K. Is there is there something that you can tell us a little bit about what what's causing the delay in 3K? Just kind of talk to us a little bit about what what exactly is happening to the slow rollout for 3K. I mean, just in short, I mean, there's there's two issues, and we, we certainly support the all the council members' support of a citywide 3K program, um, and you know it is very popular. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, lots of families out in the the in the New York City are. Um, chomping at the bit to get it citywide. Um, really, I mean, there's two things. We need to make sure that we're fully funded. Um, and so that requires not just city funding, but state and federal funding. So we need to make sure that happens. Uh, and we need to ensure that we're thoughtful about citywide space. You know, we want to, when we roll it out citywide and say this is universal citywide, we need to ensure that we have, like pre-K, we can guarantee for the four-year-olds, if you apply to pre-K, you're going to have a seat. Uh, might not be your first choice, or your second choice, but we can guarantee you that we will connect you to a seat. We want to be in the same position for a citywide three-year-olds program, um, and we have to be very thoughtful about making the space. I'd say, you know, the, the two-year rollout, I mean, the excuse me, the four-year rollout, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's certainly, um, 
we want it, we want to make it city, we're going to make it citywide. We want to make it citywide. We appreciate the support of the members to, to, to back that up and support that and make it happen. Um, but it's really just a matter of the funding and being thoughtful about the space. And uh, I'll just, I'll make my participation, uh, my participatory democracy pitch right now. I think, I think everything that you just said, and I'm, I'm glad there's a lot of awareness from the agencies, from all of you, about how, how we're doing that, how we're creating safe spaces, how we're making sure that everyone's trained. And, and what, what's really amazing, too, is if you think about District 38, and there are 27 um, plug for participatory budgeting, there were 27 members this year that participated voluntarily in a participatory budgeting project that allows for communities to make decisions about how they spend capital dollars in their neighborhood from schools, which is a very popular thing, uh, parks and streets and, and security cameras with NYPD on, on corners, on corridors. And, and this is where we're learning too about how we engage communities who, who don't speak English. And so in my district, a majority of the ballots that come back are, 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 um, are ballots in Spanish, Chinese, and Arabic. And we're, so we're, 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 we're deliberate about that work that we do out there. And we're getting a lot of feedback. And so those are moments that we should not, we should not, we should take advantage of that and spread all this message, all this messaging we just got here today. I didn't know half, to be honest, half of the things that you just presented on. I don't, I just don't know that. We gotta solve that, that's, that's solvable, that's easy. How do we get all their members to know everything they're working on because we are partners and so that anytime I'm in a home doing a presentation on Know Your Rights uh, or participatory budgeting that I leave information in their language and can offer an opportunity for one of you to come out and your, and your teams and do the presentation. That's the synergy that I think needs to happen more and more so we can get more information out into our communities. Is that a bell for me? Is that, am I? Are, um, and so that, I think, is important uh, that, that we really focus on, be intentional about, and just force ourselves into rooms, which is why I'm talking about the task force a lot, which is why I'm understanding how you feed information to each other and how we can get that information to the city council members who have district offices in every district uh, and, this, and work with the CECs and work with the community boards. So anyway, there's a lot. I think there's a lot there. Um, We need to hit, um, or we need to discuss, I should say, uh, the maternal and infant health work. Uh, and, and so tell us a little bit about what those issues are. Uh, just drill a little bit deeper about what, what, that, what that looks like for the agency specifically. And, and um, there's some really high rates. Can I share my Queen's data before the council yeah, member absolutely. leaves? Oh, we Please. have Queen's data. Oh, I think he's heading out. I'll share it anyway. Please share. Um, so um, we have 51 early learn centers in Queens. 51. 51. Great. Early learn centers in Queens. They serve I'll close to 3,400 children. In addition, we have three family child care networks which serve close to 1,000 uh, children. Thank you for that. Yeah. So um, since you asked about infant and, and uh, maternal health data, I think probably something that's at the forefront of everyone's mind, we know it's been a lot of press, is around infant mortality. So um, just some background data. In 2016, New York City had an infant mortality rate of 4.1 infant deaths per 1,000 live births, which is a slight decrease since 2015. Um, and due to a small number of deaths, the rate will fluctuate from year to year. Um, the infant mortality rate has declined 24% since 2007 when it was 5.4 per 1,000 births. Um, however, we know that the infant mortality rates for blacks was 8.0 point, uh, per, per 1,000 live births, so we're very much aware of the disparities um, across the city and there's concerted effort by the health department um, around birth equity, which is how we like to frame this work, um, that really speaks to the issue of toxic stress for women, along with um, what that means both in utero, along with when the child is actually here and the supports that we have in place, primarily through our home visiting programs. Thank you for that report. And I think that's something we wanna work with you as well and thinking about how we bring outreach to immigrant communities and, and look at barriers and remove them. Uh, so I think that's it for me right now, um, and I want to I want to offer 
the advocates uh, to to kind of give us their their testimony today. Will you be leaving members of your team and staff here? Okay, great. Thank you so much to the administration, and again, we will look fo we look forward to working with you. Um, and the. And as you, as you walk out, I, I just say that we're really looking forward to uh, the soon part of your meeting with the Moya task force and looking forward to getting some data and understanding from that as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for, for, uh, for staying and we have, we, have, we have a few panels. We want to get through as many as possible. I believe there are two parents here who made it, Nicole Ren and Mai Chong Chu. On that same panel, we want Ernie Collette, the Mobilization for Justice, and Casey Akbar. Hey, kiss. Yeah, you would you like to? Yes, that's fine. That's fine. Make sure, make sure. What's your name? We can get your Kathy Henderson. Kathy Henderson. Okay. Okay. Can we can we just have have you come over? Please, Link. Thank you so much. Our youngest New Yorker. <laughs> Just make sure you're speaking into the mic. It's red Ling to make sure that they can. We'll have the parents go first and, uh, and Ling will translate. Um, okay, um, and uh, right now, I have a two-year-old who is in a daycare. Um, I pay $700 a month for the daycare because I can't, uh, we don't know how to apply for the government subsidized uh, daycare. My husband works for a restaurant and I work part-time and pretty much most of my earning goes to the daycare. Um I'm very excited to hear that uh, the mayor plans to um, plans to make UPK three uh, a reality uh, because my son is two years old. I hope he can be in um, he can be enrolled in pre K three next year, and then we it will be a great relief to our family finance because right now pretty much most of what I earn goes to his daycare. Um, and, uh, but um, I'm very worried at the same time about whether we'll be able to get a seat or not uh, because I live in Sunset Park and uh, uh, the application for UPK in our district is crazy. I haven't applied, but I have seen uh, pictures circulating in the community social media um, where people were, wh where the parents who were waiting 
um, st like starting at mid, starting at 3 a.m., waiting for 10 hours just to get an application uh, for for UPK lottery. And uh, I want to say that please, uh, please help me, please help my family to ensure that we could get a seat, uh, to get that we can get a seat. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is My name is Pansy Chen. This is my daughter, who is two years old. We live in Zhongshan Chen. Then we have the... We 中国人但是我们的嗯所以说我希望政府可以帮我们就是中文 地方就是可以让我们带小孩，可以啊，那小孩就是可以上上托儿所。有的daycare是费用很高，然后我们家附近是啊，费用有可以申请政府补助的，但是那个地方被close了，没有开了，所以我我们不知道我们该怎么样。Uh, hi, um, I have my two-year-old with me today because um, I, I don't know, uh, she has always been with me um, because I don't know where to find affordable daycare. I'm a resident of Upper East Side um, around 120th Street. Um, um, I have looked, I don't speak English. Uh, there are some Chinese residents uh, like me who don't speak, immigrants who don't speak English live in um, uh, in Upper East Side now. Uh, so contrary to the popular belief, Chinese people do live outside uh, you know, Chinatown, Flushing, and the Sunset Park. Um, and uh, I've looked into daycare in Chinatown. Uh, they cost anywhere from seven hundred to a thousand dollars, which we cannot afford. And uh, subsidized daycare, um, and then near us, there's no subsidized daycare. Um, there used to be one, but they closed down. Uh, so I don't know where to turn to. Um, I, whatever information, I try to look near where I live. They're either in English or Spanish. I don't have anything uh, in Chinese. And then, as you can see. Um, the I cannot go anywhere uh, without my child with me. Uh, even to this hearing, I have to bring her with me because there's no one else that I can leave her uh, with. And uh, it's it's a blessing, but it's a huge burden. To it, at times, it's very stressful. Um, I want to say, please, um, everyone, help us. Um, we we we. I'm trapped. Um, it's. Uh, I, I don't want to be a sad. A lot of people in our situation, they send the baby back to the home country to make them, they, they're called satellite babies. Uh, I don't want my daughter to, I almost took that pass, but I, in the end, I decided not to because I don't want to be separated with my child. I want to raise her um, with whatever I can, but I need help. Thank you. Thank you to the two parents and for Ling for translating both of those testimonies. I just want to double check, uh, is Moya still here? Can you raise your hand? Thank you. Uh, the Department of Education, is anybody here from DOE? Yes, thank you. Uh, and then also uh, ACS, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, DOHMH, is DOHMH in the house? Okay, thank you. Okay. Chairman Menchaca, thank you for inviting me here today. I, um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Kathy Henderson. I'm a regional manager at um, Footsteps to Brilliance. I was joined here today by Casey Ak Akbar, a kindergarten teacher at PS 197 Queens, but she had to leave because she had to pick up her daughter. So 
in any case, but I want to talk about the transformative work that we've been doing in five New York City schools this year. And we've been leveraging the mobile devices that families own to scale early literacy. So um, we ha we're an app, we're an early literacy app with thousands of books, games, and resources in both English and Spanish. Um, part of our solution is incorporating families into the solution. So for every student license, there's a family license, and families are part of our professional development, and we encourage them to use these resources with their children at home. Uh, and when we work with districts outside of um, uh, when we work with districts outside of New York City, when we work with district initiatives, we build the, the work out with throughout the community and we work with other agencies to, again, scale these early ri literacy resources because our mission is to have every child kindergarten ready. So we have testimonies from the teachers and the principals from these pilot schools we've been working with this year and we would love the opportunity to share the resource because um, what we're looking for is our New York City contract to be able to really, um, to, to really scale the work citywide and to bring um, economies of scale to that pricing to really make this a, a good resource for your New York City schools. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony, and I have, your, I have the, the testimony here as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to testify here. Uh, we're going to take this uh, on a little bit of a separate route, but it also still applies to uh, what I think a lot of immigrant families uh, need access to. So before I start, my name is Ernie Collette. I'm a staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice. And my name is Claire Thomas. I'm a professor at New York Law School, and I direct our asylum clinic there. So we have two topics that we'd like to discuss with you today. Uh, one that we think that the City Council should be aware of, and um, another one that we uh, are fairly sure that the City Council knows of through uh, actions that could potentially have uh, be taken by the federal government. The first one I want to talk about is um, access to public benefits, and uh, the second topic is uh, proposed public charge regulations. So recently, um, for immigrant families, uh, access to benefits is, is it's sort of myriad. It's a very difficult sort of conversation to have in a, in a three-minute conversation. But I wanted to focus on there was a recent uh, a case that was brought up to the New York Superior Court uh, that effectively instituted the state agency for, uh, for public benefits, the, the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, to issue an effective, uh, a directive effective immediately that would allow asylum uh, uh, asylum applicants, uh, children, uh, derivatives, uh, to be able to receive uh, safety net assistance, which is a federal, uh, which is a state uh, provided assistance for uh, public benefits. So it allows for a cash grant and a shelter allowance. Uh, there's a discrepancy, uh, and the reason why is because uh, it allowed, uh, uh, by with asylum applicants, they were then designated by OTDA uh, to be designated as um, pru call, which is permanently residing under the color of law. It's a determination that allows um, individuals to receive state-funded benefits. Uh, there's a discrepancy in the fact that uh, special immigrant juvenile uh, children, SIG kids, have not been afforded that uh, designation, that pru call status. Um, as a result, um, claimants are individuals that actually have uh, very similar uh, situations that could apply for both asylum and or uh, special immigrant juvenile status, um, have access to one benefit, uh, cash assistance, but may not because of their, just simply because of their immigration status. And that would definitely affect uh, a household. Every little bit helps as we've seen here today. So having access to that uh, and encouraging maybe the state um, and the city to, to take a look at this uh, could uh, meet a need. Exactly, and some SIG petitioners, some applicants for SIG are young parents, and that's what our agencies have seen in many of the other agencies in the room as well, where these petitioners could have their own children, be it U.S. citizens or immigrant children as well, who might in turn be eligible for special immigrant juvenile status or asylum, but are extremely vulnerable and are left out of this gracious safety net that has been given to asylum applicants, but not to these quote-unquote SIG kids and their derivative SIG kids. So the second part of our testimony today that we want to draw your attention to are the um, 
upcoming uh, changes to the public charge regulations, these proposed changes with the Federal Office of Management and Budget to expand the types of public benefits that would designate a recipient as a quote unquote public charge. So if after notice and comment period these draft changes are implemented, the recipients of such non-cash assistance programs such as Supplemental Needs Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as Food Stamps, Medicaid, WIC, um, a Child Health Plus, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, as well as the Earned Income Tax Credit, will face public charge grounds of inadmissibility. So this may prevent non-citizens from obtaining lawful permanent residence here in the United States and um, would have uh, huge uh, impacts on those families as well. It's a, it's a matter of also a mixed status household. So you have uh, families, obviously, that have U.S. citizen children that have access to these particular benefits, um, obviously, regardless of their immigration status, because they're U.S. citizens. And so it potentially, again, potentially, because we don't know the final rule yet, and we still have a 60-day notice and comment period, it could potentially uh, make a family have to decide whether or not they want to get benefits for their children, uh, food stamps or medical insurance uh, provided by Medicaid or, or CHIP uh, or not have to go through those benefits would then potentially drain city resources. Uh, you'd have you know food, uh, more reliance on uh, food uh, food kitchens and soup pantries. Uh, sorry, soup pantries and food kitchens. Uh, you'd also have reliance on uh, free lunch programs, uh, and basically on the fact that the uh, families would have to make that decision. So we just wanted to draw that to your attention. Thank you both for, for walking us through that. And if we can follow up on, on some of the work that we can do in preparation, uh, and hopefully we will get a good ruling, but uh, you, um, you, you pointed out some really kind of incredibly important things that the city should be looking at now, yeah. and not wait until the end. So really thankful for all your testimony. And I wanna thank the parents for, for here being here. I think they, they've already left, but um, it's not always that you can get parents here, uh, so it's always a special moment, and having a, a young two-year-old child here uh, uh, to be witness to this is, is important as well. And so thank you, thank you to them. Thank you for this panel. Uh, just mm -hmm. Next panel we have uh, Kim Sykes, Aracelis Lucero from Massa, Mary Chang, a Amy Torres from Chinese American Planning Council, Diana Noriega. And I think we just have one more panel after that. So if you have not yet given us your uh, appearance card, please do so. If you want to begin, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Okay, hi. My name is Mary Chang from Chinese American Planning Council, and I wanna thank you, um, Chairman Chaka, for, and the members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today. Um, the mission of Chinese American Planning Council, CPC, is to promote social and economic empowerment of the Chinese American community, immigrant and low-income communities as well. CPC was founded in 1965 as a grassroots community-based organization in response to the end of Chinese exclusion years and the passing of the Immigration Reform Act of 1965. Our services have expanded since the, our founding and to include four key program areas, child development services, education and career services, community services and senior services. CPC is the largest Asian American social services organization of the US and providing vital resources to more than 60,000 people per year through more than 50 programs at over 30 sites across Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. CPC employs over 700 staff whose comprehensive services are linguistically accessible, culturally sensitive, and high, highly effective in reaching low-income families and immigrant families in the community. To that end, we are grateful to testify about the issues that impact the individuals and families we serve, and we are grateful to the council and their leadership on these issues. Um, personally, I was also a director of early child pro program. I taught in an early child pro program, and now I oversee <laughs> all of the early childhood and school age program under CPC. Um, 
to be able to do that, I think, um, really speaks to the demand and the need of services within the community for that. Um, so today we present the issues identified through our early childhood education and our Asian um, child care service resource and referral programs. We have found that our immigrant families have major concerns that fall under enrollment, language access, and cultural competency, and discrepancies in community-based organization versus Department of, um, Department of Ed sites. So first off, I think um, the two parents who were in here previously um, who was testifying, I really wanted to speak with them in terms of clarifying services. There is a lot of confusion about the services that is provided and how to access it. And there's also a lot of myths that come out. So there was in the- You said myths? Myths about how to apply and what are the standards of applying. So I think um, it has to be very transparent. And I think a lot of families come in with that confusion that, oh, if I come into a subsidized site, they're gonna have a spot right on for me. And the truth of the matter is we have to follow Department of the Guidelines. There's ratios that we have to meet. Um, as for also applying for UBK. So that enrollment process is very confusing for a lot of families, regardless of if you're immigrant or a f new family with a child who is three or gifted, want to apply for the gifted uh, uh, talented uh, programs because each one of them have, uh, have an enrollment um, Sorry, I'm a little nervous today. But each one of them have an enrollment process. So if you come in and you say, I want to apply for 3K, then you have another process at three years old. At four year old, you have to apply again for pre-K, UPK. Then at five year olds, you also have to apply for kindergarten. And each of those process is another process, especially for immigrant families, that they do not know how to access. And the Department of um, Ed doesn't, really support in the way that they need to support the programs. It relies what do you need in support? I think that it needs to be very clear cut for a lot of these families when they have to access every single year into the portal, which is not clear on what they have to do. How do they find the codes? How do they find their district zones? For immigrant families, it's not an easy access for them. And even when I have to go and access online, a lot of the time is that if you access it online in English, it does not look the same. So I gave you a sample of it. When I click on for the Chinese translation, I don't know how to figure it out for them either. So what happens is that I do an orientation for them for general to for all of the parents. And then for each of the families that need services, I have to go with them one by one through the process. And so that relates relies a lot on manpower. And a lot of times it's just a director and a bookkeeper in the site. And how do you have that manpower to do that? Right. But we have to, we have to make the time for it. It cuts into our day, but it's also a need that we see that parents do really require and understanding their zoning and addresses and how that applies to them. Why is there this district that I'm confined to? And they don't understand that process as an immigrant family. Got it. And the agencies don't do anything to create that that uh, space for understanding and education. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I have some questions for you, but I want to I want to get through the panel sure. and then we'll come back. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Very enlightening uh, experience from the CPC point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Araceli Lucero. I'm the executive director of MASA. Um, Plaza Camati, which means thank you in Nahuatl, indigenous uh, language of Mexico. Um, and so MASA partners with Mexican and Latino immigrant children, youth and families in the South Bronx um, to develop strong learners and leaders who fully contribute to the broader community. We envision a community that is civically engaged, empowered, and educated. Um, MASA is a very grassroots organization that was started in 2001 to meet um, the needs of specifically undocumented students. And very quickly we realized the, um, the need to start as early as possible. Um, we were fortunate enough in 2013 to partner with the Parent Child Home Program and with Deutsche Bank on an initiative to target the Mexican community. And why this is really important um, for the organization is because the community that we serve is really what people consider hard to reach, vulnerable, um, 
undocumented, predominantly um, immigrant families. Um, over half of the people that we serve have less than a primary school level education. Over a quarter speak an indigenous language, such as Mixteco, and um, um, the majority have less than uh, 30,000 or less um, annual income. When we took a snapshot of the actual families that we serve that have children zero to five, those statistics actually are far worse and they are facing a lot more challenges. Um, and so- Can you repeat that again? From zero to five? Yes, so we okay, took a that's, snapshot- that's important. So we took a snapshot of the zero to five and what we found is that most of them are um, much more recently arrived than the general population um, that we have. Um, um, so about 10 years or less. Um, so 24% of those parents in comparison to 17% for our general population. Um, while 25% of our general population speaks an indigenous language for the zero to five, over 40% of um, the parents uh, with children ages zero to five speak an indigenous language and the average household size is bigger. Um, so the average for the general population at MASA is four members and for um, zero to five, it's five members. And they have similar incomes, which is $30,000 or less. So you have more people, less resources um, for the family. Um, and so that's just to give you a snapshot, but really what I've been hearing throughout the day is that there's really a need to focus on specific communities, who is being left behind. This idea of like everything for all is not working for all. And so what I would like to say is that, you know, we really need to look at ways in which people who are already trusted in the community um, can provide these types of supports. So the Parent Child Home Program, we're very lucky to have partnered with a lot of people, um, and we're very grateful for that opportunity because it has allowed us resources to address um, the needs of our community, but it has been very intentional, and that's something that you've been talking about a lot today, is that there has to be more effort um, to address the needs in particular communities. Um, there's so much that I want to say, but I know I don't have a lot of time. I echo everything that um, Mary has said. Um, one of the biggest challenges is just general confusion. Um, and quite frankly, clarity around like who is actually eligible for what and when. And there's a lot of confusion right now, especially with the merger coming on of Early Learn, Head Start. Um, there are really not a lot of seats. There's confusion and they have to go to the actual sites. Some people just won't even answer questions and say, you know, we're just closed already, we're full. And so they don't even get any answers to their questions because they just get shut down. People don't have time. Um, um, the other thing that I would say is that we're focusing a lot on 3K and pre-K, but zero to two, uh, there is not a lot out there for zero to two. Um, there is, um, actually I'm gonna focus on the South Bronx because that's where I am. Um, and dur when Early Learn came on in 2012, um, approximately 17% of the seats of the of, um, home-based child care providers dropped. Um, and that was just in general in New York City. For the South Bronx in certain areas, about 50% of the, the home-based child care providers um, dropped. And why is that important? Because culturally speaking, even me, my child right now is being taken care of either by his grandma or a family member. Um, culturally, it is really important, and, we've, and even when we talk to families about the barriers to entering 3K, there's trust. Um, when we talked about their experience going the first couple of days into pre-K, there was a lot of confusion around, like, you know, people were just told, drop off your children and leave, right? This immediate separation. Um, and so some parents, after we successfully enrolled them in 3K, we were, we're in District 7 and we were fortunate to be one of the first districts that started last year. A couple of parents took their children out of the program a couple of months into it because there was just not a lot of sensitivity around you know, the transition between being with your child all the time and then just automatically you know, being told you can't be there, you just need to drop now them you off. use the word sensitivity is that also a kind of cultural competency item yes. to bridge that sensitivity? Yes, yes, okay. yes, okay. Um, definitely. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is that um, 
when this whole masa actually applied for upk in 2014 we didn't get it which is understandable because we had never had a site and the city wanted to make sure that it was efficient to use current licenses so i get it um but we were trying to do a pre-k um for indigenous speaking families and um what I would say about that also is that we shouldn't be encouraging people who already who are already trusted community brokers to also be included in this process because they're there. There's programs that can help. You know, CHCF I know has trainings. The Parent Child Home Program has the Family Child Care Model. There's ways to have home ba to increase the fa the home based child care providers, but also train them. Right, if it's a matter of trust, it's a matter of giving them more support, there are existing programs. So how do we also focus on the zero to two and make sure that we're starting as early as possible because a lot of the families that we serve that have very young children are not entering the workforce or looking for the opportunities because they simply don't have any childcare. And the, sometimes there's turn off with 3K and even pre-K and so really you have these moms that want to access oppor other opportunities who can't and further, you know, making things not equal and accessible to all. Um, I have a lot more information here, but I want to make sure that my colleagues get to speak. But the last point I would say is um, we've had a lot of horror stories around the special education services um, from families, like people realizing last minute that they needed bilingual evaluators who are very scarce. Um, to families having evaluators ask them to meet them in their car to do the evaluations. Um, and then just a lot of misconceptions around language development and discur professionals from pediatricians to teachers to other professionals really discouraging families from you know, their primary language. Um, I don't think there's enough support or education they just tell them you have a, your son has a lag because he speaks two languages. He's behind, right? And there's no explanation around like, well, that's really like that's natural, right? He's gonna be fine. It's just left at that point until parents freak out and they stop, you know, talking with their children in their primary language. So I have a lot more data and information if you would like, but I will stop right there because I want to let and, my And we would know. like all of that. <laughs> and, and I think what, what, what I'll say now really quick is to say that, that we are committed now that we've had this first time ever public hearing, like we do with all the other, we've done a lot of firsts in the last four years, is to follow up. We've built a task force that we want to hear from and build a relationship with that task force that's supposed to kind of be doing this Within the, within the agencies. And so we want to bring that in. And the more clear that you can be about that kind of bridge and support, the, the best. That, 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 that's the kind of best information that we want to be able to bring your voice in and, and do this all together. So that's, that's my, my commitment mm -hmm. to you all. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Actually, this, uh, we all work together very closely, so we know each other well. So I'm Diana Noriega, the Chief Program Officer with the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families. CHCF is a nonprofit with a 35-year history. We combine education, capacity building, and advocacy to strengthen the support system and continuum of learning from, for children and youth in the early child care sector and then the K-12 sector. Uh, we are one of New York City's four child care resource and referral agencies. That includes Chinese American Planning Council. Um, and we hold the vantage point to address the challenges of access to quality childcare and opportunity for vulnerable populations. And because we do direct service, we actually end up being a unique voice in the room, oftentimes with policymakers. So CCRNRs, we're gonna advocate for four particular points. One, investment in family childcare providers and CCRNRs. CCRNRs ensure family childcare providers provide high quality programming and that families can gain access to those programs. Family child care providers ensure the safety of our children, establish children's developmental foundation, and contribute to a city's economic engine by allowing parents to participate in the workforce. FCC providers can give more individualized care to meet the needs of working families. We know that they say 3K is all day, but it ends at 3 o'clock, whereas we know family child care providers are usually open till 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening. So family child care providers also help foster emotionally secure and interpersonal relationships for everyone involved. So often we're talking about the abuelita who's used to taking care of children and has grown accustomed to being the caretaker. 
Um, for vulnerable families that are facing a multitude of challenges such as immigration status, language barriers, job and housing insecurity, family child care providers are really the consistent force in the midst of that chaos and they do not get paid well. So they do this work as hard work. So we know that they're best positioned to ensure that the support and services that these children need, they have access to. However, there's a consistent inability on the city and state level to invest in this workforce, and there's additional threat posed by the local business owners with the expansion of universal pre-K, which prioritizes center-based programs and could have a devastating impact on family child care providers, because you're removing three-year-olds from their actual ability in the voucher system to work with. Second, in the FY18 federal funding, included an astounding 80% increase to the child care development block grants. It's actually one of the largest increases we've ever seen. OCFS is currently drafting the funding plan for New York, which is set to be released before May 1st. It's imperative that we pay attention to the strategic and timely use of these funds to ensure that the quality of programming continues and that there's equitable access. And I want to say equitable, which is very different than just access to supports and services so that it expands across New York State for working families, particularly our most vulnerable populations. We currently know that only a small percentage of families who are eligible to receive vouchers are in the program. And I want to mention really quickly, um, the DOE, ACS talked about the family resource centers. There are only three. We know, though, that when we're talking about effective and efficient work, we're talking about scaffolding that kind of intervention to involve parents in the conversation which is also why family child care providers are uniquely positioned to do this work because they're from the communities, they know the parents, and they're, if you equip them with the right skill sets, could be the appropriate gateway, gateway between the different communities. And then I wanna end on one final po point. New York State is the third largest state with the, with the number of children and immigrant families. So we really also, we didn't talk about the DOE transition to early learn, but we have very real concerns about that transition and the aggressive timeline that is being put in place and the lack of consistent and clear communication across state and city agencies and the different regulations and requirements between those entities and how confusing that can be for a family child care provider, let alone a family member who's accessing different voucher points. Thank you for, for that. I think I wanna work with my partners, uh, my, uh, a few other chairs, uh, in education, ACS, and and let's, let, I'm sure this is not the first time that you've kind of presented these ideas to the city council, but we are committed uh, here to ensure that the immigration component, um, the kind of the, the sensitivity, cultural competency around immigration is taken into consideration. Uh, and then the other question, well, I'll come back with questions. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Sykes. I'm the Director of Education Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition, and just wanna say thank you so much, Chairman Menchaca, for giving us all this opportunity today. Uh, most of you, a lot of you know the NYC. We're an umbrella policy and advocacy organization, um, and we do a lot of work fighting for English language learners, um, young English language learners to adults to make sure they have um, access to a quality education. And I wanna talk today about a new project that we launched this year um, because I think it holds a lot of promise for how a we can- A youth or new? New project. Sorry, it does you. involve youth, spoiler alert. Um, I think it holds a lot of promise for how we can leverage resources that we already have. Um, and in order to identify systematically um, and better connect immigrant families with the uh, pre-K and 3K programs, uh, and along the way to identify the barriers that they are facing, we started a new initiative called the Linking Immigrant Families to Early Childhood Education, or LIFE Project. Um, and MASA is uh, a key uh, part of that project. We funded four member organizations um, to go out and do work in their communities, um, working one-on-one -on -one with immigrant families to uh, help them go through the application and enrollment process if that was right for them. Um, in addition to MASA, we're working with LSA Family Health Service. They're working in East Harlem um, and with Fifth Avenue Committee. Um, 
in Sunset Park. And thank you to you all. Um, I know you've been connected with, with them and to support the initiative. Um, and we're also working with Cidadao Global, which is providing input um, from Queens, from the Brazilian community there. Um, and these groups have gone out. They've um, done uh, workshops to help introduce families to programs. They've done canvassing in the neighborhood. Uh, they have helped families uh, learn how to use email addresses and really just taking them soup to nuts through the whole deal, providing support um, every step of the way. Um, application clinics and what we've seen is that there is an enormous need um, to echo my colleagues points there's a huge need for this kind of support our groups have uh, done outreach to more than 20,000 um, immigrant family members and at this point have helped uh, 82 families enroll in pre-k or 3k here in New York City and many of those families are amongst the hardest to reach as is evidenced by the fact that two out of three Families said that they would not have submitted an application without that help. Um, and we've been working in close partnership with the Department of Education, and they've uh, provided training and um, some technical assistance to really make this um, partnership possible. So we're appreciative of that. And um, along the way, we've identified a few key barriers. Um, and I just want to, um, Aracelis, Mary, um, and Diana have mentioned a lot of like common themes. I want to touch on one point that didn't get emphasized as much, um, and that is anxiety and fear related to immigration status, um, particularly in this climate. And I think we're seeing families um, hesitant to provide information, having a lot of questions about whether you know it's safe to go to programs and just really needing more information um, about that. And I think in some cases this fear has been heightened by what's happening with public charge, which was um, already testified about. So that's another layer in this dynamic. Um, and it's important to know um, and that in there are settings um, where families applying for pre-K or 3K are asked um, about their child's immigration status, and um, that was touched on earlier as well, and that comes up because programs are braiding together funding streams, um, including federal child care funding, which... Um, and you're talking about UPK programs? Yes, there are families um, who, if they're applying to pre-K or 3K, there are situations in which families can be asked to um, provide more information, um, and sometimes it's uh, requirements related to, you know, income, and there are situations in which, um, in which a status question does arise. Um, so I think, you know, that factor, you know, all of these factors coupled with all of the questions, um, and it is a, you know, it, it is a complex thing for families to go through, particularly when they don't have the level of systems background or familiarity with technology that other families um, do have. And I think this is, you know, really underscores the need for a partnership like what we're doing where we're leveraging the deep connections and resources in our community-based organizations and using that capacity to expand and extend um, the DOE's outreach capacity. Uh, and I think that needs to be something that, you know, City Council and DOE can think about institutionalizing moving forward. Um, and I also think we're seeing a need just to be really clear and articulate what the protections are for immigrant families in pre-K and 3K just to combat some of the you know questions and anxieties we're seeing and to just be super clear and, and purposeful about that. Um, there's only one other thing that I'd really love to mention. You touched on quality earlier and we talked about dual language programs and those are wonderful. But we also are in a city where there are like 180 languages pro spoken. And you have many programs where there are lots of different languages spoken within that one classroom. And I think we need to work more from like a programmatic side, building capacity for how we support all of those kids when they're not in a dual language program. And it's much more a super diverse setting. Um, that's a lot. And this whole panel, I think, really kind of outlined a lot of, in a lot of ways, the first panel just kind of kicked it off and, and, and kind of created a, a real sense of urgency and need. Um, but as providers, you're on the ground, you're seeing this. And so I, I'm, I'm thankful that we were able to kind of hear from you. There's some stuff that's super urgent that I want to get to, like the fact that there's, there's, there's a multiple stream uh, of 
of programs that are requiring a status question in that, that just that shouldn't happen. Uh, so we want to follow up with you on that offline and talk about that. Um, but as far as uh, continuing the conversation, we, we could stay here for, for hours and kind of work through that. And I do want to do that in a space where we have DOE um, and Moya and some others to, to listen so that we can follow up. I am confident that the new chancellor, uh, Carranza, will, will understand and hear this uh, with some fresh eyes and some commitment that he's already started making on the ground as he, as he meets new communities. Um, and not just because he's, he's a, a Mexican brother, but because he really understands, I think, the, um, the commitment that the city is making in these big gestures, but needs to kind of get on the ground. And that's what we want to just bring him into the neighborhoods to understand. So that's another kind of commitment that I want to make, that we, we will offer that opportunity as soon as possible to get into these spaces to, to deal with. The crunch time for uh, the transition is is major. And we we heard it from some of the parents that there's a lot of confusion. The whole thing's already confused, and now you're kind of pressuring all this to happen quick. And that's a problem. It's happening. It, it, I, can, I, can, I can talk for the, forever on this. I'm going to stop here. Let's keep talking. Any other final moments or ideas? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Just one thing that I want to make sure we also keep in mind that you're, and you keep on emphasizing, is how do we provide the full around support to immigrant families in this fear of deportation, detention? And so, one thing that I want to highlight is, is that there are people who are thinking about it. Um, Montefiore and Masa are partnering to figure out how we support children. Masa piloted, um, actually, with Little Sisters of the Assumption. Um, a support group for children um, ages uh, five to nine years old and partnering with parents on how to talk to their children about what is happening. And so it is on the city council's um, proposal docket. I don't know where it's moving or You're not. You're referring to budget. Yes. Yes, awesome. And so, um, and so part of that work is uh, for um, the uh, psychiatrists and psychologists in um, Montefiore to train support staff and to have CBOs like MASA to the Know Your Rights trainings and emergency planning with clients. But that has to be, you're right, that has to be taken into these other settings as well that also serve immigrant communities. So I just wanted to highlight that. I just wanted to note that um, we found the, the DOE's outreach team to be quite receptive to hearing input about barriers families are facing and I think um, we've seen through all of the work that we've done with the DOE that there's a real value to sitting at the table together for long periods of time and kind of hammering things out together. And we're looking forward to working more closely with ACS um, and with other divisions of the DOE to address these issues too. I, I know you mentioned uh, a task force potentially happening and we definitely would love well, to. Well, by law it's passed and it, it was already supposed to happen and it didn't, hasn't happened yet. So, well, we But it's supposed call. to happen, uh, a task force that Moya leads with all the agencies that are impacting immigrants mm -hmm. and uh, they're all supposed to kind of meet, talk, understand, and kind of report back to us. So that's what I'm talking about. So th there's already something in motion that we want to that we want to impact, that we want to be a part of. I think it would be helpful if advocates were also involved in that conversation because I think oftentimes when we're in front of a lot of these agencies, we're getting very different messaging. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. We'll get back to you. Um, and while we appreciate kind of working, having the conversations, it's really helpful if there were, were one room where all the folks could really kind of say, but that's not pragmatic or tangible or efficient and effective because that's not how it's working on the ground. And I think that's a part of the disconnect that we're seeing. So there is a DOE 3K transition advisory group that we are a part of and several organizations on this panel are. Um, the problem is the DOH is not in that room. The problem is, is that the OCFS is not always in that room. Sometimes they are. But when you're talking about streamlining these systems, which is where a huge portion of the problem comes from, is that they're not integrated seamlessly. You have folks, you have empty Head Start seats programs actually being forced to potentially like shut down because the DOE is signing up kids who could be eligible for Head Start into 3K. So this is what I mean by there needs to be a more comprehensive conversation about systems integration so that we're actually not turning down money from the federal government because we can't fill Head Start seats. But when we go, advocates go to the DOE and say that, 
we don't know what the follow-up is around how do we really integrate to make sure that DOH is talking to DOE, is talking to ACS, and there's one system that's tracking all of these providers and vouchers. And I think that's where we, we started today. Um, I think it's the first time they kind of got into a room and started talking with us. And, and I'm a big, I'm a big uh, supporter and believer in spending three hours talking about it. Just putting everything out there so everyone knows and has the same information, and then we can kind of move forward. And I think agencies are resistant to that because we ask them to do a lot of reporting, um, rightly so. I think it's it's our prerogative to understand, but these conversations are going to be very very important, and and we're going to be asking for that, demanding it. So thank you to this panel. We have one more panel. Uh, the panel to close us off will be. Jessica Gorlick from Human Rights First, Amy Amy Pent Pent with the with Hassan. Oh, this is Legal Aid Society. Yeah, so Legal Aid Society has two representatives, and the Interfaith Center of New York. The Reverend Dr. Chloe Breyer and the, the Committee of 100 to make the Brooklyn Botanic Garden free again. This is uh, Constance Lasold. If you can come up here as well. And that'll, did I miss anyone? Yes, okay. Yeah, definitely come up. Yeah, it's sort of. Okay, great. Thank you all. So you will close us off, uh, or close our, our hearing. And I know we've talked we've talked about a lot of different things and. If we can, if I can ask you to concentrate on any any specific ideas, recommendations, especially things that have yet to be spoken to about, um, that's what that's what I'm looking for in this last panel, to 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 get us through. Uh, should we start on or to our right? You want to start? You want to kick us off? P please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Constance Lessold, and I'm uh, very delighted to be here today to represent a new group forming uh, the uh, 100, the committee of 100 to make the Botanic Garden in Brooklyn free again. I saw some puzzled looks out here as why in the world we would here. Uh, <laughs> so I think I'll start off right off by saying why I'm here. Um, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden was free for an entire century. When in the beginning of the 20th century, the country was full of immigrants and uh, they really used Prospect Park, the Botanic Gardens, other places which were totally free and in other boroughs also, of course. Um, and then during the World War I, the Depression, World War II, botanic gardens remain free. Only in the 90s, when we were supposedly a rich city, did the botanic gardens start to put on fees. Uh, the philosophy, perhaps, in the background was that people appreciated things more if they paid for them. Um, <coughs> that can be argued. Um, the Botanic Gardens fees, as I say, were put on in the 90s. And one of the Caribbean city councilmen of that period said, and it makes me cry to remember it because I was there when he said it at a press conference at the gardens, that this would be the first generation of Caribbean children not to have a free Botanic Garden. At that, so it was, that, it was that important to him that he came to the BBG to say that. <clears throat> I was on the board at that time 
of the Haitian American Daycare Center located in several of them in Crown Heights. We certainly thought it was important. In fact, we thought it was so important that we had our three to five year old children lined up to attend the International Conference of um, Children's Gardens in botanic gardens all over the world. And those children from the Haitian American Daycare Center delivered petitions from children and adults in Fort Greene so that it would be known it wasn't just the ones that lived next door that cared. Uh, to Judy Zook, who was then the um, president of the Botanic Gardens. And uh, Judy Zook said, Connie, Connie, this is not the time or the place. Well, we thought it was. The children knew what they were doing. They were five years old. They delivered the petitions. I wish that I had known of this ahead of time because I would have brought you the pictures of them. Um, I know I don't have much time left, but our committee is made up of people who have been deeply involved with the uh, gardens. They have been volunteers, they have been teachers who have brought children to the gardens, they have been artists who took pictures in the gardens, myself whose family is very involved in the healing aspects of the gardens. In fact, my son went through all the educational aspects. The gardens has educational, healing, Artists, every kind, four, just let me say, for the children who still need it from immigrant communities for all these reasons, and they're not getting it. And our committee is made up of people of all different backgrounds and neighborhoods and, and all different economic uh, levels, and we would love for you to join us. We have had our first every Friday morning from 8 to 12, which is the only free time now. Most people don't know it. They, if they know it at all, they knew it was Tuesdays and Saturday mornings and Fridays for seniors. You have no free time in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden now except from 8 to 12 on Fridays. And we, every Friday morning, we are taking a group of our members through and deciding how to approach this problem. The, the, the president of the gardens made sure he met us on our first visit. Uh, we were happy to have him join us, and we had a discussion, and I would just finish off by saying that he is concerned about these issues, and I would recommend you to reach out to him. Uh, he's thinking about can we give free passes to uh, people on welfare, or at least we suggested that, or to people with uh, some of the special programs that you mentioned before. Right. Uh, we, we cannot continue, though, to have these healing resources and recreational resources re removed uh, from our public. And our, uh, so please take it seriously to Absolutely. add cultural affairs Absolutely. to your committees. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, Constance, I, I want to say thank you for being here today. Um, I think when we look at the question that we put out for this committee was, what are, what are the needs of our of our families, immigrant families with children zero to five? And I think you reminded us that we have so many needs in our communities, and our institutions go beyond DOE, go beyond ACS and DOH, DOH, MH. They go into our cultural institutions, and so these are spaces where we can uh, sometimes only have these spaces to go and be free and be with nature and be with uh, be with nature. And so I'm I'm with you. And as a Brooklyn member of the council, I want to I want to work with you and think about this more for our immigrant communities. Um, I want to talk to uh, uh, to Scott Medbury. Uh, I've known I've I've worked around Brooklyn for a while. I was a borough president's office for a long time, working on capital projects. And so he knows that there's a massive investment of city capital dollars in this institution, and and there needs to be there needs to be a bridge, an intentional bridge, to our communities, especially our our immigrant communities that are facing so much trauma. And these spaces can offer an opportunity for breath. I hear you. We're going to go through the rest of the panel, uh, and we'll follow up afterwards. Thank you so much. Yes, hello, my name is Chloe Breyer. I uh, direct the Interfaith Center of New York and am an Episcopal priest. 
at uh, St. Um, Philip's in Harlem. We are part of the work with grassroots religious leaders around the city for 20 years from different faith traditions and are partners with the New Sanctuary, um, uh, the New Sanctuary Coalition. I just wanted to bring to the attention of the committee this, a, a small but important group of um, uh, families of undocumented um, peoples and those who are in sanctuary, in physical sanctuary, in um, houses of worship around our city, two of whom are, in, are publicly there, Amanda Morales at uh, Holy Rood now for almost seven months, and a newly arrived family also at uh, Fourth Universalist on Central Park. One of, of Amanda's three children are um, under the age of five. Uh, what has been remarkable and I think is worth considering um, in light as it, it, it shows up the problems of other uh, families that are not in churches or in houses of worship, um, but it has taken 150 volunteers or so in the case of Holy Rood to do the basic um, work of, of supporting Amanda and her kids. The cost of taking her family out of society has been that great. Everything from um, uh, the food they eat to the parent-teacher conferences, the, you know, the um, teacher, the head principal has gone over to meet with her in the church, but that's hardly a, an expected way of behaving. Likewise, um, emergency visits at nighttime, um, uh, immunizations, basic um, questions about, Im uh, about health, education, and most of all, the stable and predictable world that children of the ages of zero to five, no matter who they are, require in order to be sta stable adults and um, contributing members of societies. And just as a final note, um, the rites of passage of so many of our fellow New Yorkers often take place between zero and five. I'm thinking of baptisms, of circumcisions, of um, so many different uh, initiation rites that our religious communities have that without a, a parent, it's certainly not the job of the state to in any way support those things, and yet it's part of being human and part of, of growing up, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and I know there's there's a lot of work ahead of us. There's a symposium uh, that I've received an invitation for. Um, all the work you're doing with Robbie and, and the team, it's just incredible. So thank you so much, and, and we look forward to working with you. Um, I want to spend time with Amanda as well to kind of get deeper into an understanding about all the resources, resources that came together for, for this moment that should be... Um, should not be permanent at all and should be figured out and addressed and confronted. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Pont, and I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society and the Immigration Law Unit. Today I'll be talking about three topics. First, um, the needs of adults with children who are in removal proceedings, families in removal proceedings with children under the age of five, Legal Aid's work helping non-citizen parents undertake planning in the for their children in the event of deportation or detention. Legal Aid's advocacy on shelter access for asylum seekers, asylees, and victims of trafficking with young children. And finally, um, I know it was touched upon previously, <coughs> but a, a small discussion of the forthcoming regulations on the public jar um, bar to the adjustment of status for non-citizens. So my work consists of primarily working with a vulnerable yet very resilient population of adults with children, families, mm -hmm. and removal proceedings. They're predominantly from Central America, and they have come escaping um, difficult violence, domestic violence, and have a severe trauma history. They have a great range of needs due to the trauma that they have suffered and the adjustment to a new country with young children. These needs include health and mental health services, education, affordable house housing, um, accessing trustworthy and affordable childcare, and most of all, assistance accessing these necessary services and other social and support services. One, one thing I'd like to highlight is in terms of accessing employment, um, a major challenge that adults with children populations face is that they, uh, upon release from detention, um, they, from immigration detention, they routinely have to wear ankle monitors, which makes it very difficult to find employment because these ankle monitors are uncomfortable, large, require constant charging, 
and, and therefore make it difficult to find and retain employment. Just to ver go very quickly, I wanted to also highlight what Legal Aid Society is doing in this climate to help non-citizen parents plan for the care and custody of their children. Um, we included the advanced planning fact sheet with the um, written testimony for your reference. The first is a form called the Designation of Person and Parental Relationship. This allows parents um, to allow a trusting adult to make health and education decisions regarding the child. Next is the New York State Department of Education Emergency Contact Form. So in the event that um, ICE picks up a parent, someone, in, someone can pick up the child instead of the Administration for Children's Services picking up the child. Additionally, there's a travel authorization form. In the event that um, a parent wants to send a child abroad to live with a family in advance of deportation or to join um, a parent after deportation, this form allows a trusted adult to travel abroad with the child um, and this form complies with the Hague Convention on Child Abduction. Um, I spoke with my colleague at Human Rights First who will speak more about this, but I just wanted to highlight success that the Legal Aid Society had along with other providers in advocating for better shelter access for, um, for asylees and um, trafficking survivors. And just one, um, this was also highlighted before, but I just wanted to note um, just something on the public charge grounds. We've already seen after the leak, a Columbia University study has al already noted that there's been a 10% decline in accessing of SNAP and WIC benefits in, in counties that have a high um, percentage of immigrants. And some things that we just wanted to highlight is that we really are urging um, the city, the Legal Aid Society is urging the city um, to prepare for this imminent policy change. And we, ex we would expect that the council would agree that the city needs to prepare to engage in advocacy such as comment writing to help stop this policy and consider other strategies. Additionally, um, provide outreach and access that will enable thousands of non-citizen households with immediate concerns about whether the new rules, new rules apply to them to get the answers they need even before the new rules become final. And then next, provide alternative means of support for families who feel compelled to go forego assistance. Um, and then additionally, um, we respectfully encourage that the council help to ensure that the city is prepared to take the following steps. Ensure interagency communication and coordination, request a meeting with the Office of Management of Budget, um, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and monitor for the impact of those rule changes, and finally continue working with community partners to pre best prepare for this, um, this change that is very um, daunting and a big task ahead of us. Okay. I can, I can lean. Thank you. My name is Jessica Gorelick, and I'm a social worker at Human Rights First Refugee Representation Program. Um, we work with asylum seekers, um, providing legal and uh, social work services. Um, I quickly wanted to start out with a very little anecdote of one of our clients. Um, we met her back in late 2014 while doing screenings at the Adults with Children docket at the New York Immigration Court, a docket that doesn't currently actually exist. Um, they, she was there with her three kids. They were three, five, and 12 at the time. Um, she was on the verge of being homeless, which she ultimately did become homeless, having a myriad of other uh, issues, accessing food, clothing, uh, was confused about systems and education and all sorts of things like that, and very much needed uh, legal intervention because she needed support with her asylum case. And thankfully, we were able to take on the case and provide legal services, free legal services and social services and um, they eventually were granted asylum in August of this past year, 2017, which is wonderful, but also we can remember that there was nearly three years that the family waited in this sort of limbo while waiting for their day in court. So also just to highlight a lot of the things that our clients are facing, including these long wait times while they're um, waiting to uh, receive status and be eligible to a lot of the services we've talked about today. Um, just talk a little bit about uh, the fact that at that time, Human Rights First, um, was working with other organizations, were working to provide free legal help to unaccompanied minors with funding from city council. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, cases like this particular client and her children um, were not eligible for those services as uh, a family. Um, so Human Rights First 
first commends the City Council for its initiative in providing legal representation and support for immigrant children in New York City and its, for its decision to later expand and cover the cases of mothers and children. Uh, the Unaccompanied Minors and Families Initiative in particular has made a tremendous difference for a large number of immigrants who fled violence in their home countries and now live in the five boroughs of New York City by providing them with a free legal representation in New York's immigration court. We all know that whether a person has legal representation is one of the most important factors in whether his or her immigration case is granted. Um, however, there are still many immigrant families and individuals that are still in need of services. Um, Human Rights First provides legal representation and social work support uh, to our clients on a pro bono basis. Uh, we work with uh, in staff and we provide legal services directly and through a large network of pro bono counsel throughout uh, firms throughout New York City. Um, and we also, um, sorry, I'm trying to be succinct here and taking longer. Um, we also, as I mentioned, provide psychosocial support. And we win about 90% of our cases, um, so kind of evidence of the importance of having legal representation. Um, as we know, New York City, based on our conversations today, has been a great supporter of immigrants. Um, many of our clients do become homeless during the life of their asylum case, as my colleague here was mentioning. Um, New York City is a right to shelter city, so our clients can seek shelter from DHS. Um, and we actually worked with a team of advocates in the Legal Aid Society, Safe Passage Project, and the Ferrick Center for Social Justice at Fordham University. Um, and we worked with the NIC NYC Department of Social Services and Moya to create a policy to identify and better serve asylum seeking and traffickers survivor homeless families. And through this process, we provided multiple trainings to PATH staff, and this has resulted in families more safely and e easily accessing shelter and referrals for legal services from PATH to our organization. So we actually have a number of clients, which is very exciting, that was, were referred and are currently our clients. And it's been a huge boon in helping both us and I believe PATH better serve their clients. Um, and while there are many struggles that our asylum-seeking families do face, there are a number of New York City and state policies that exist to protect asylum seekers. They're eligible for health insurance once they file, once they file their application, safety net assistance or SNA once they receive employment authorization, WIC, um, HIV AIDS services through HASA and also educational services but unfortunately as has been highlighted repeatedly today is that most of our clients and the vast majority of service providers including a number of city agencies are not aware of this eligibility and many asylum seekers are left to suffer in silence. It is crucial that all staff at New York City providing agencies learn about the unique challenges and needs of asylum seeking and immigrant families. Our clients frequently come to us reporting that they've been told they should learn English or are not eligible for any supportive service as, as asylum seekers because they are quote unquote illegal. We have had clients turned away from shelter even though they are homeless. We have had intervene um, related to grave misunderstandings and lack of cultural competency of staff at the Administration for Children's Services or ACS who all too often provide services in a punitive rather than educational and supportive manner. Our clients are nearly always told they're not eligible for Medicaid. We constantly have to provide advocacy and teach city employees about the New York City and state policies. And who's telling them that? Um, workers at various agencies. So it's happened at PATH, um, it's happened with health navigators, um, it's happened with ACS workers, usually on the ground staff. Um, it, it seems to be a lack of training. Yeah. So it's not only incorrect, of course, but like you said, lack of training. And again, this kind of points to this idea of how, how do we train more people to have a basic understanding about access to and mm -hmm. access to services, but also rights. Exactly. Every New Yorker should know about all our rights so that we can, you know, anyway. That's the dream and that can yeah. happen. Okay, awesome, sorry, continue. No, no, no problem. Um, and also just based on what you were saying, it also kind of kicks up all of those fears we've been talking about because people then if, if there's sort of a punitive interaction or people are told you're not eligible, you're illegal, those types of words that are used really make people extremely, you know, they cocoon right in and do not seek any more services. Or you're not going to get legal services because <laughs> uh, you've been convicted of a crime. Okay. Insert <laughs> criminal carve out mm -hmm. and the mayor's attempt to remove due process uh, in the city of New York. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Um, so we have been able, through our work, to directly affect change for many of our clients, but we know there are thousands out there without any advocates that are deprived from key services and facing re-traumatization because of the lack of training that we see. 
So we, overall, we believe that an expansion of programming that offers free legal and social services to asylum-seeking families, along with greater education and training for city employees who interface regularly with this community are key. So okay. thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate discussing this important topic with you. Thank you. I want to switch seats maybe with somebody. Uh, yeah. That's okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss how New York City supports immigrant families of children under five. My name is Betty Baez Mello. I'm an attorney and I'm the project director of the Early Childhood Education Project at Advocates for Children. For more than 45 years, Advocates for Children has worked to ensure a high quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success. We focus on students from low income backgrounds. Every year we help thousands of families navigate the education system starting from the time they were born. We appreciate that the city is providing tens of thousands of children access to early childhood education programs, such as 3K, Pre-K, and Early Learn. Research shows that participating in high quality early education programs is particularly beneficial for dual language learners. The DOE has taken some positive steps to make Pre-K more inclusive to immigrant families, including opening 33 new dual language programs, and also providing access to Pre-K, providing access for phone interpretation services to all three 3K and Pre-K programs so that staff can communicate with the parent even if they speak a language other than English. However, despite these efforts, immigrant families face barriers to accessing early childhood education. This has been raised before, but depending on the funding source, certain programs inquire about a children's immigration status and parents become worried and confused as they try to determine which programs they are eligible for based on their child's status. Once enrolled, not all programs provide children and their parents with adequate support in their language. The city should invest in additional du dual language programs as well as professional development for all 3K, Pre-K, and Early Learn staff so that they can support those dual language learners that are in their programs and have strategies and supports for engaging families. Now, throughout our casework, we have become very concerned about the barriers that immigrant families face in accessing preschool special education services. Um, there was a parent who addressed this earlier today for example, one of our case examples is that we assisted a mother of a pre-K student who I'll refer to as Ahmed. Ahmed's teacher expressed concerns about his development in the November meeting with his parent, and the parent requested that the DOE eva evaluate her child for special education services. The DOE responded by mailing the parent a list of approved evaluation agencies for the parent to contact. Ahmed's mother began calling the agencies in December. However, because the parent speaks Turkish and English, all the evaluation agencies said that they could not provide the evaluations. They turned her away, saying that they could not conduct evaluations for children who speak languages other than English. That was the Department of Education. The Department of Education sent a list to the parent of evaluation agencies. The agencies. And those agencies told the So parent. by proxy and through a subcontracted the, the agency. agency that were contracted okay. said they could not provide the evaluations. Thank you. Correct. I'm going to follow up on that. The evaluation, packet did, the evaluation packet that was sent by the DOE did not offer the parent any instructions for securing evaluations if the agencies refused. So Ahmed's mother asked his pre-K program for assistance. She also asked assistance for an agency in her borough that focuses on helping families of young children with disabilities, but they also didn't know how to get evaluations for this child. The parent then reached out to the Department of Education directly. However, instead of arranging the evaluations for a child, the DOE staff told her that she should find a friend to conduct to serve as an interpreter for the evaluations. Now, besides the fact that the DOE has a legal obligation to provide the evaluations, the parent had no bilingual friend that could serve as, a, as an interpreter to accompany her to the multiple evaluation appointments. Finally, the parent reached out to Advocates for Children. After we intervened, the Department of Education began evaluations in mid-February with an interpreter but needed additional time to complete the evaluations. Due to these delays, Ahmed did not receive special education services until May, es essentially going the entire school year without the services he needed because his parent was an immigrant whose native language was a language other than English. Ahmed experienced, um, Ahmed's parent ex 
experience these challenges, even though she speaks some English. Immigrant parents who speak only a language other than English face additional barriers. The DOE's preschool special education evaluation packet is available only in English, and the evaluation agency's family with call do not have access to phone interpretation services. The DOE must address these challenges and ensure that they provide timely evaluations and services for preschoolers regardless of their family's home language. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have one question and follow up on, on the evaluation, and I wanna talk further on, on the case and just to give us more information about how that happens and the kind of back and forth and the subcontractor that has to come in. And, and uh, remind me, is, the, is that test a free test to the parent or does the parent have to pay for that uh, after the list is provided to the parent? The evaluations are free. Paid for by the Department of Education. Yes, right, so okay. Um, and, okay. Yeah, let's let's talk afterwards. I, I want to have a, li a little bit more understanding on, on the case uh, without going into to more kind of specific detail. Um, I do have a couple more comments for for um, specifically uh, for uh, Reverend Breyer. We we did get your questions before this hearing about rapid response, and so if you if you heard during the hearing, we tried to kind of get a better sense about about in general what agencies are doing. But we want to make sure that we push on the administration to, to provide us, to create, to listen to us as a community, including New Sanctuary Coalition, to understand how that rapid response has to actually happen. I have no doubt that we tell the administration to create a rapid response program. They will. Um, we're talking about all those programs that they've created because we've asked them to, and sometimes they just they fall flat. They're uh, not culturally competent. They're not sensitive. They don't have the right resources, they don't have enough of them. There's always problems there. And I think one of the things that I wanna do in closing this, this hearing is to say that we started this conversation with a few parents that were on the ground and super not only motivated, but full of tools and, and education and resources. And even they have some of the hardest times getting what they need for their kids. And the thing that kind of changes the dynamic is not one parent advocating for one child, it's when a, con com a, co when a community can come together and say, this is what we need. Here's how you plug into what we have in the fabric of our neighborhood, be it an immigrant community, be it a geographic community, be it a school, be it a daycare center, whatever it is, that's the connection that we need to bring. And that civic participation is what is gonna drive this change at the administration. They have to listen to it, we have to be in the rooms, we have to spend the two hours talking about all of that, uh, but we will. We that's that's the work. That's the, that's the work that we have to do. So I thank you for staying um, till what are we now at five o'clock. Uh, we've had a long hearing today, but we've had some really good insights into what's happening um, from multiple perspectives. And I believe that we we ha we have enough right now to really kind of set the, some stuff into motion uh, with some pressure points that are real not just the federal government that's coming down, but our governor, our mayor, um, and just like the lack of, of response that we're having from some of the agencies and kind of build on that and say, we gotta change this. We gotta bring, bring you into communities. And in community, we will find the answers and we will find solutions. Um, and so I, I feel hopeful. I don't know if you do. Um, I, know, I know a lot of the testimony uh, revealed some of the harder, uh, hardships that we have in our in our in our neighborhoods but I feel I feel good um, this committee is supported by so many folks but I want to highlight two in particular our council um, Indiana Porta uh, who continues to just not only to be the, the, the legal mind to this uh, committee um, but a true partner in, in so much and so I hope you have uh, uh, continued access to her and, and the things that that you have to bring to, to her in the committee um, also Elizabeth Kronk uh, our our incredible legislative analyst who brought so much of this information to us before so, we could, so I could come in as a chair with a lot of understanding um, to give me a framework and to be able to understand what's, what's happening uh, uh, that you all just help uh, bring more texture to. And, uh, and also my staff at, at, at the district office, I wanna thank you all as well uh, for all the communications that we're gonna be doing on this and bring the com conversations back into our communities. Uh, Ling specifically, who's our outreach, who translated for some parents and has really been really working hard to build that relationship with the Chinese community 
um, uh, like many immigrant communities, don't trust government inherently for whatever reason. And most of them are actually valid reasons. And so we're chipping away at that. Um, and the victories that we, I think, see in the front or in the ahead of us are not just about changing, changing policies, but using the assets in our neighborhoods, like our botanic garden, and thinking about how we change that. IDNYC has been one of those great bridge builders to organizations like the cultural institutions. There's no reason why we can't go back and knock on the door and say, you got to do right by us. Let's work together. Um, so thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I hope it's beautiful outside before we came in. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to working with you on this issue and other immigration issues. Thank you so much. And this hearing is now adjourned.